Uh, but let me introduce right now from uh, you know, this gentleman's traveling, so folks, you've got to understand that um, um, he's traveling and he's using a, a cell phone, so it could very, he could, uh, you know, cut off at any time. So we're going to enjoy him, listen, learn from him while we have him. He's uh, really, uh, I, I respect this man. His name is Dennis Avi Lipkin alias Victor Mordecai. He's a well-known author, researcher. He's written over six books or six books. He knows and he's going to um, tell us all about what's taking place with Islam today, world events, and so on. I'm going to turn the floor over to Avi Lipkin. Mr. Lipkin, thank you so much for joining us and for agreeing to come on tonight, sir. It's a special honor to be with you. I've heard so much about your show. And it seems like all the people I work with listen to your show. So I said, well, I better be on that show then. Well, I'll tell you, and you're making a great sacrifice tonight to be on. Uh, I, I do know that. Uh, I do know that. So here's what we're going to do, Mr. Lipkin. Um, we've had situations happen, or situations happen in Quebec, an Islamic terrorist attack in Quebec, or so it appears. Uh, we see everything going on with uh, with ISIS across the uh, across the Atlantic, over into into Europe and uh, um, into the Levant, as they say. We have an, an imposter in chief, a renegade in chief, a Muslim in the White House, which your wife, by the way, had uh, through monitoring Arabic uh, communications, had known about since 2006. Uh, we're just going to turn you loose, uh, Mr. Lipkin. You go ahead and uh, take us where you want to take us and however you want to take us. By the way, folks, his website is vicmord.com. It's linked off of Hagman and Hagman.com. Please visit his website and certainly support Mr. Lipkin. He does great work and uh, and also grab his books. Mr. Lipkin, you've got the floor, sir. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, since this is the first show, and I hope not the last, so I'm going to tell a little bit about myself. Uh, not because I'm an arrogant, uh, how shall I say, whatever, uh, but because um, I'm an American-born Jew. Uh, Jew or Christian doesn't matter. Uh, we are all um, created equal and in God's image. And uh, the, the, the religion of America, which I call Judeo-Christianity, and Judeo-Christian Western civilization and democracy, uh, all of this I, I consider one religion. And, you know, Jews are one side of it, Christians are another side, a big side, <laughs> a very big side. But we believe in certain principles uh, that developed uh, from the Old Testament, from the New Testament. Uh, believe it or not, I'm going to say from Greek philosophy, from Roman republicanism, uh, from the Renaissance, from the Crusades, uh, from the Enlightenment. Um, and there are lots of stages, you know, leading up to the American Revol Revolution, uh, the Emancipation Declaration uh, of President Lincoln freeing the slaves. They never heard about that in Africa, by the way. Um, and, of course, women's suffrage in the 1920s in the United States. So America, uh, basically, in my opinion, represents a, a, a continuing progression of uh, the human race uh, from more primitive to less primitive and eventually more cultured and more educated. And uh, the American experience is a very, very unique experience. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the other countries, of course, follow the vanguard of the United States, those countries which are modern and Western and free thinking. And uh, I moved to Israel for a number of reasons. I won't go into too many of them, but one of the primary things I felt uh, moving to Israel at age 19, I'm 66 almost, uh, I've been in Israel all these years, less the years I'm preaching in America, in the churches and the synagogues, but I left America never really hating Americans and never really hating Christians, but it had been uh, inculcated in me in Hebrew school that the Germans slaughtered us, so the Germans are all bad. Uh, the Russians slaughtered us, so the Russians and the communists are all bad. Uh, the Catholics slaughtered us, so the Catholics are all bad. And the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants of America, who never killed one Jew, uh, one day, rest assured, I was taught uh, that they would kill the Jews too. So by age 15, uh, I write to David Ben-Gurion, our first prime minister. He actually answers me. At age 19, I'm out of here. I go to, to Israel, and uh, I meet my wife a year later. And my wife is a Jewish woman, like I'm Jewish, but she's from Egypt, and a Muslim country, and I'm from America, a Christian country. And uh, let me tell you, my wife and I have been together 46 years. She has been the most incredible instructor on what's going on in the Middle East and understanding the Arabs, understanding the, the Muslims and their way of thinking. And um, I come back to the United States, you know, 20 years later, and uh, the last 25 years, 
Uh, I come back and I, I try to warn the Americans that the Middle East is not the Midwest and that uh, the Islamic way is the uh, diametrically opposed system to the Judeo-Christian system. And uh, my wife, listening to them for the last 30 years, picks up very, very unbelievable uh, radio and TV uh, talks and reports, and and you don't get this in English. I mean, you have Al Jazeera in America, in America today, but it's not in the Arabic. It's in English, and it's all been doctored for the American Christian market. Um, so let me give you a few quotes uh, of what my wife picks up. For, for example, 30 years ago when she first started, she would hear the Saudis saying, listen carefully, this is maybe the most important thing I'm going to say tonight uh, and, and the, in the next few nights that I will be on your show. The Saudis said 30 years ago, even if it takes us 150 years, we will make a, America a Muslim country. And my wife looked, they were crazy. How could you make the greatest Christian country on earth a Muslim country? And now, 30 years later, my wife listens to the same broadcast, same people, 30 years older, and they say, we thought it was going to take us 150 years to make America a Muslim country. We were wrong. It's only going to take us 30 years to make America a Muslim country. And so the idea behind this is that America, as the greatest Christian country on earth, and forgive me for using a rude expression, America is the country with the balls, or at least it used to be. Uh, the Europeans were all wimps. I mean, anybody who had balls left Europe and came to America. The wimps stayed home. Uh, if America falls to Islam, then Europe falls to Islam. The whole world falls to Islam. So the primary and ultimate target of Islam is the United States of America. Forget about Israel. Israel is of no consequence for the Muslims. Once America falls, Israel falls. Everything falls. So all the emphasis is on how to make America a Muslim country. And uh, Obama, by the way, forgive me for defending him, but he's nothing unusual. He is a continuation of 30, 40, 50 years of presidents who all serve the Saudi and Islamic agenda. Uh, it is true, he is a Muslim, and he is much worse than a so-called Christian president who serves the Muslims. Um, and so the plan is using uh, political correctness, uh, using the courts, using the, uh, forgive me for saying it, Democratic Party, and also certain parts of the Republican Party, uh, to bring in tens of millions of Muslims to live in the United States of America to alter the ethnic composition of the United States of America. Um, and uh, uh, little by little, suppress Christianity. Judaism is going to disappear on its own. Uh, I'm going to show that in a few minutes, how that's going to happen. Uh, but Christianity will be suppressed and suppressed and suppressed, I believe, until at some stage uh, there's a revival. Uh, and I'm a Jew. I'm not a Christian. What do I share in the Christian churches? Christian revival. Because if America becomes Muslim, that is not good for Israel. So uh, to make a long story short, uh, I've written six books. I've got, you know, ten DVDs and ten CDs, most of which were produced. I don't know if you heard of Chuck Missler, Coin House. Uh, he's a great man. I work also with uh, J.R. Church, Prophecy in the News, uh, Noah Hutchings, Southwest Radio Church. Uh, I work with, these two are from Oklahoma City. Uh, now there's a new ministry, Sky Masters, uh, uh, Sky View, uh, what do they call Sky Watch? I'm working with them too. I worked uh, many years with Zola Levitt, rest in peace before he died. And so, you know, I kind of get around uh, in the Christian world. And the funny thing is, I'm a Jew. I'm not a Christian, I'm a Jew. But I love the Christians, all denominations. I love the Christians more than the Christians love the Christians. And I'm saying, for heaven's sakes, America, wake up. Restore your great roots. Don't let this rot continue where America loses its faith, its Christianity, and becomes a politically correct, non-Christian, neo-pagan country. If you do that, Islam wins. Islam is marching, Islam is convinced Allah has given them the victory, and the only way to stop Islam is by a strong Christian America. Fantastic, and you're exactly right. Um, wow. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, uh, again, I, I just want to give you the floor. We want to give you the floor because it, it, all the information you're sharing is so valuable. By the way, you did serve in the ED, uh, IDF, I'm sorry, uh, from what, February of 1972 through January of uh, uh, 1973 as part of the uh, um, well, as part of the IDF, you were a spokesman for the Judea and Samaria Command under uh, uh, under Lieutenant Colonel Raphael, uh, I believe it was it Hor Horowitz or I, I think it is. Horowitz, anyway. yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so uh, you, you, I, you've I got, to add, you've got a lot I, of good, what, good stuff. Go ahead. 
you know what? I, I served 30 years in the Israeli Army Reserves, uh, 16 in artillery, just as a private, a simple crewman. Um, I didn't really understand the Hebrew uh, so well, so I, I really could not go ahead. I got out of reason for that. Uh, the 16 years later, I was transferred to the Army Spokesman's Office, so there I knew six languages. So they made me a lieutenant, and uh, you know I was a, an Israeli Army officer spokesman for 14 years. Um, and uh, by the way, when I was 52, they said, "Okay, you know we, we need we have a young officer who needs your position, and so that we're going to retire you." And I said, "No, I love girl soldiers who are 18 years old in uniform." And they said to me, "Grandpa, scram." <laughs> so. <laughs> so <laughs> So uh, I was sent home, and uh, so now I'm in the Army of God. You know, I'm full-time uh, uh, writing books, uh, speaking in churches, synagogues, radio, TV. And again, it's a special honor for me to be on your show tonight. I'm very pleased well, uh, that you had me. We're honored, but I, I think I should warn the listeners that we, we have a fugitive, or I shouldn't say a fugitive, um, somebody who has been uh, sentenced uh, in Switzerland for hate crimes. Uh, you want to share that, what what happened there? Yeah, sure. Well, what happened was, what happened was, uh, I've been going to Switzerland many times over the last 20 years, and um, uh, the EDU, you can look it up, EDU, uh, Christian Political Party, it's a conservative party in Switzerland. They have a multi-party system. And uh, the Muslims, uh, you know, the Muslims are like 10%, 15% in every country in Europe, and the same in uh, Switzerland. And so they have mosques, because you have freedom of religion, they have mosques. And so the Muslims came and said, you know what, now we want minarets. Minarets are those tall spires, those tall towers with loudspeakers at the top. And they broadcast five times a day, Allah, Akbar. And, uh, you know, the politically correct media, including Fox News, says Allah, Akbar means God is great. Allah is God and Akbar is great. And I share in every church that this is a mistranslation and that Allah Akbar means Allah is greater. Allah is greater. There's another God that he's greater than, and that God is our God, the God of the Jews and the Christians, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they say that their God is greater. And you know who said he was greater than God before his fall from heaven? Absolutely, Satan. Satan? Okay, so this is a hint uh, as to where I'm going with this. Uh, do you know what the Muslims call Allah? The Muslims call their god Al-Makr, M-A-C-K-E-R. Al-Makr means Allah is the greatest of all the liars and deceivers. So, if you're a Christian, who's the greatest of all the liars and deceivers? Satan. Satan. Okay, so I, do you understand the direction I'm going in? So anyway, yeah, so they are broadcasting three, five times a day, starting at 4.30 in the morning. And if you live within a, a two or three mile radius... You, at 4.30 in the morning, are going to be awakened by what President Obama calls the sweetest thing he ever heard in his life, the azan. The azan is the call to prayer to the mosque. And that azan says, Allah Akbar, Allah is greater than the other God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, of course, uh, the Swiss uh, people all of a sudden got very upset, and they said, we don't want this stuff, in our, we don't want this noise pollution and this sacrilege broadcast in our land, Switzerland. And, uh, and, by the way, if you know the flag of Switzerland, they've got this white cross on a red ensign. This is the, um, the, the ensign. This is, this is the flag of Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland was created as a Christian country, a democracy. And the, the Swiss Royce angry with me because it says, our democracy predates American democracy, which in a way is true. Anyway, so I went to Switzerland twice in 2009. I spoke in a total of 23 cities. And I explained to the Swiss people that if you let them have these uh, minarets, and they're coming to America, by the way. The minarets are coming to America. They're here already. Uh, if you allow them to have minarets, they are going to be broadcasting the superiority, the supremacy of their God over the God of America, which is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I don't care what the uh, atheists say or the ACLU. The God of America is the God of the Jews and the Christians. America was a Judeo-Christian country until Obama came to power, and Obama comes out in his inaugural address. Look up Obama's inaugural address of 2009, January. He says, today America is a Christian, Muslim, comma, Jewish, Hindu country. America is no longer a Judeo-Christian country. The purpose of the Islamic agenda is first to nullify Judaism and then to nullify Christianity. So anyway, so uh, praise God, November the 29th, 2009, the Swiss had a national vote 
uh, about whether or not to allow the Muslims to have minarets. Uh, and praise God, uh, 57 and a half percent of the Swiss voting population voted down the minarets. And so the the Christians were very pleased with my business there. It seems like I had some kind of an influence. I spoke in front of 10,000 people altogether, little groups. Uh, I was on Swiss national TV, and I said, Allah is the devil, and Islam is not a religion, but a criminal psychosis. I said, Islam is not a religion. We have to get over this nonsense. Islam is not a religion. It is a criminal psychosis greater than Nazism. The Nazis wanted to kill only the Jews. Islam wants to kill the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, the Buddhists, the blacks. And then Allah commands the Muslims to slaughter each other. So obviously Allah is not the God of creation. Uh, Allah is not our Father who art in heaven. Uh, Allah is a uh, moon god, a war god, and a sword god uh, bent on the destruction of the human race. Now, of course, if we're all in the image of God, uh, Satan cannot say that he is greater than God unless all those in the image of God are dead. Uh, so, uh, so one more thing I want to share, and I, I kind of said it, but I want to repeat it again. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Jews and the God of the Christians, is a God of truth, not lies. He is a God of covenant. He doesn't break covenant. Uh, he made a covenant with the Jews. In the Bible it says that covenant is for a thousand generations. He then made a covenant with the Christians. I get into a lot of trouble, by the way, the rabbis are saying this. Uh, and I say, yes, the Christians are grafted into the olive tree of Israel. The Jews are the uh, roots. The Christians are the branches. And together we make up the tree. And any attack on the roots is an attack on the branches. And any attack on the branches is an attack on the roots. And, uh, by the way, I don't know if, I, if you knew this or not. I didn't mention it uh, in the pre-broadcast, but I'm working uh, to form a new political party in Israel. Israel is a multi-party system. I'm creating a Judeo-Christian Bible block party to run for the Knesset. Our population uh, is 8% Christian. I'm forming a party that will represent 8% of the population, which is Christian, 6% of the population, which is married to the Christians. And, by the way, 3 million out of 6 million population in Israel has lived in Western Christian countries. And I want to bring uh, those values that made America the greatest country on earth. I want to bring those values to Israel and create an American-style party based on the Judeo-Christian system. Fantastic. What a fantastic yeah. idea. What a fantastic initiative. And we wish you all the best with that. That is that is truly a great thing. Okay, sir, go ahead and continue. We've established now, and I think it's safe to say that uh, for you disclosing the fact that Islam is a criminal psychosis greater than, than the National Socialist Party of Germany, of Nazi Germany, of course, and uh, the uh, Allah is is actually Satan. Um, for for saying that in Switzerland, you were you were charged with hate speech. Yes, and I was convicted in absentia. I did not even know about the court case. That the Muslims did it very very smart way. Uh, they did it when I was in the United States uh, preaching and traveling. When I got back to Israel, I got an official document from the Israeli Ministry of Justice that they got from the Swiss Ministry of Justice that I had been convicted, and they did it in such a smart way that we were even too late for an appeal. Wow. So, so, so where does it so stand he, right now? Go ahead. So well, it, where it stands right now, the judge, uh, uh, let me tell you like this, the judge was very embarrassed. The judge had no no uh, free room in this matter because he has to do what the law says. As long as Islam is defined as a religion, and you, I spoke against a religion, so I get convicted. But what he did was he offered a uh, compromise in which the EDU Christian Party paid a thousand dollar fine. Uh, my sentence was uh, commuted to ten years of probation. If I go to, I can go to Switzerland, by the way. I can go skiing and uh, like a tourist visit people. But if I just say Islam once and they tape it and it gets to the court, I go straight to the slammer for three years. So um, I'll tell you the truth: the Swiss people have not invited me back uh, since then. Uh, I have another five years to go. And to tell you the truth, you know, you know, America and Canada keep me very busy. Uh, well, yeah, we want to keep you over here, keep you free, keep you talking, um, uh, and, and thankfully you're doing so. Uh, uh, during our conversation before this broadcast, you had said some very interesting things, much like we talk about, uh, Mr. Lipkin, about the greater picture, the bigger picture here, how Islam uh, fits into all of this, the, the New World Order, the CFR, the um, you, you know the grand scheme of things. Um, I, I just I, I want you to go ahead and uh, give us your take on current events and everything going on. Oh, Joe, if we can please, start yeah. start with Syria no, and no, 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 uh, no. Assad. Uh, I, what we I think know, Assad's I know exactly. 
I know exactly what I can say in the next few minutes before the phone cuts off because I'm heading into the hills pretty soon. But I will say one thing like this. Uh, my um, uh, material that I offer on my website, my books, CDs, and DVDs, and again, they're produced by Missler, you know, by Coyne and House, so they're kosher for Christians. My, my teachings um, start out with something called the Five Deceptions of Islam, that Islam claims to be a religion of love, claims to be a religion of peace, claims that Allah and God are the same, claims they believe in Jesus Christ, and claims that the Quran is the holy book, the divine and infall infallible word of Allah to Muhammad. Now, this could take me half an hour, an hour, two hours to share in the churches. When I do a seminar uh, of many, many uh, hours or days, then I do this full two hour on the five deceptions. Uh, we could talk about it, but I go to, into the next step. The next step in the message is the one world government. And, um, you know, let me tell you something. I'm not a Christian, but I'm very close to being a Christian because I love the New Testament. I love Jesus, and I love the Christians. It doesn't make me a Christian. Like, for me, Jesus is your father. For me, he's my brother. <laughs> you know, so uh, anyway, right. so uh, I, uh, so, uh, but I read the book of Revelation, and I see there the dragon, uh, which I say is Islam. And I heard this in many churches, by the way. You know, so I, I, you know, I go to church. I don't only preach. I listen. And I learn things, and these pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fit. And the harlot riding the dragon is not some sexy uh, naked woman. The harlot is a man, a woman, or a system paid for services rendered. A harlot is someone who does not serve the Lord, but serves mammon. And, you know, Jesus teaches, and I agree with this, by the way, that you can either serve the Lord or serve mammon. You cannot serve God or serve the Judeo-Christian ethic. Uh, and then be bribed by the one world government, and uh, they say, okay, now I serve God. No, no, you're, if you're bribed, you're bought out, you're finished. And the Torah talks very, very much against bribery, that it blinds the wise, and it uh, it um, distorts the uh, the judgment of the judges. Uh, anyway, so um, I say that the one world government is the harlot riding the dragon. Islam is the dragon. Uh, and what's happening now is that uh, in the last hundred years, since the uh, creation of the motor engine, and the, I mean, motor engine was before, but I'm saying oil, petroleum, a motor engine, and all the fabulous wealth that has accumulated, not only in the hands of the, the Muslims, but in uh, many Westerners, and uh, the aircraft industries, and the ships, and the cars, everything that uses petroleum. Uh, this is a whole world that did not exist when the Founding Fathers created the United States of America. The United States was created as a, basically an agrarian country, America still is very much an agrarian country, um, but uh, what has happened is that uh, all of a sudden, in the last hundred years, you have something called the robber barons. You know, the CFR stands for Carnegie, Ford, Rockefeller. And these people, the only thing that matters to them is money. And uh, what happens is uh, the United States in uh, World War II and before World War II uh, decided to block Jewish immigration from uh, Nazi Europe because the Saudis, you know, were saying, the Arabs were saying, if you let the Jews out, we go over to Hitler. So the Allies, the British, the Canadians, and the Americans decided not to give visas to let the Jews out, meaning they sealed the fate of six million Jews uh, to death in Nazi Europe. After World War II, uh, the U.S. was, again, the Westerners were very much anti-Israel. Uh, you know, in 1948, you know, the West was not happy. George Marshall did not want the Jewish state. The British were, were, were uh, abstained in the UN vote. Uh, the Canadians, I don't remember what they did. But um, the point I'm saying is that the, the world then was concerned about uh, so the Soviet Union, uh, the Cold War, and so it was important to keep uh, on the good side of the Arabs. So again, the world was very much uh, in favor of the Arabs and against Israel. Uh, of course, when Stalin uh, recognized the Jewish state of Israel, he recognized it because he was sure with all the communist and socialist flags flying in Israel that Israel was going to join the Soviet bloc. And when Israel decided, well, you know what, we've got six million Jews in America, uh, we are going to be neutral in the Cold War. So Stalin felt betrayed, and so he threw all his support over to the Arabs. Uh, so, indeed, we see today some of the Arab countries are pro-Russian and some are pro-American. But, again, you know, Israel has such a small population, and only now Israel is beginning to develop its oil and uh, gas uh, fields. Um, Israel doesn't have the kind of money that the Islamic world has. Again, the, the harlot wants the money. The harlot wants the oil. And so what I share in the churches is that the people who are really controlling Washington and controlling the United States, they're not Christians. 
they are money people, they're corporation people, to hell with Israel, to hell with the Christians, that's their approach. Uh, we're going to make money here, and the rest is uh, nothing. And now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to fast forward, because I'm going to conk out any minute here with my phone. Um, why is ISIS um, um, actually a good thing? I mean, ISIS is a horrible thing. Why do I say it's a good thing? Because ISIS is so crazy, and it is so uh, symptomatic of Islam altogether. Uh, it is not a, a crazy aberration. Islam, ISIS is Islam. It's exactly what the Saudis do in the public square by beheading people who have been convicted, uh, chopping off of arms and limbs. Uh, I, I mean, Saudi Arabia does very, very horrible things, and it's all in the name of Islamic uh, Sharia law, which they want to bring to America and Canada. And so what happens is ISIS gets the spotlight, whereas Saudi Arabia was always ignored. Iran was ignored. You know, there's no. Did you know that there's no homosexuality in Iran? Because all the homos were hanged by the uh, Khomeini uh, Ayatollahs. So uh, what we see here is we see regimes that are basically ignored by the world, and ISIS then comes and does absolutely most horrendous things to the Christians, to the Kurds, to the Yazidis, to the Shiites, and even to their own fellow Sunnis who are not kosher enough, not religious enough. So what happens is the world all of a sudden sees 9-11 coming back with a vengeance, and also the world says, you know, something's wrong here. And what I want to say here is the following, and this is uh, something I'm sharing now at the Missler Conference and all the other conferences and churches I go to, uh, is that ISIS is backed. This is the key point. ISIS is backed by 92% of the young people of Saudi Arabia. The young people of Saudi Arabia go through the Wadi school system, and they all come out ISIS. Jordan is pro-ISIS. These countries uh, eventually will fall to ISIS, and there's nothing America or anyone else can do. Uh, by the way, one of the things my wife picked up in, in the broadcast, is the Saudis were saying, these Americans are hallucinating. They think they're going to bring democracy to the Middle East over our dead bodies. This is your ally, the Saudis. My wife picked that up for the Saudis. There will be no democracy. Democracy is a Judeo-Christian ethic. But there will be no democracy in Islam. So what I'm saying is when ISIS takes Saudi, they're going to say this king of Saudi Arabia is a heretic and a traitor and should be killed. He's a collaborator with the Christians because he sells oil to the Christian economy. And then the money he gets, he reinvests. Uh, in the American and Western economy, and therefore he should be killed. No true Muslim should be spending money for the Christian economy. So what I think is going to happen is, I believe the word will get out that ISIS is going to blow up the, the oil walls in Saudi Arabia and the Middle East, and then the one world government, the harlot, uh, under the auspices of the UN, is going to pass an emergency decree and divide up Saudi Arabia and all the oil-producing countries, which will be occupied by Western forces, which, by the way, could include Western countries like China, Communist China, Japan, and India, because these countries are hungry and thirsty for oil. And they cannot tolerate the idea of this crazy ISIS blowing up the oil wells. So I think, and I'm saying this every night in the churches, I think ISIS uh, and Islam are going to be terminated very soon. The harlot is going to behead the snake, the dragon. Wow. Wow. That's a lot to take in and comprehend, but it makes perfect sense, Mr. Lipkin. It, it, it does make sense. So, um, okay, um, I'm just going to let you go ahead and continue as if you're, you know, at a presentation, go ahead and continue. Where you, you know where you're at in terms of geographically when you, you you're likely cut out. So I'll just give you free reign. Okay, I'm in the Panhandle of uh, Idaho. All the Muslims who want to kill me can now come to the Panhandle of Idaho and look for me. And um, I'll be speaking in a nice church tonight up there, and then back to uh, Mr. Conference. And um, uh, all I can say is this is the greatest country on earth, and I believe that uh, history. It's like a pendulum. History swings from right to left to left to right. It goes back and forth all the time. It's nothing new. America started out as a Christian conservative country, and over the last few decades, the pendulum has been swinging to the left. Uh, you know, in the 60s, they banned prayer in schools. In the 70s, Roe versus Wade with abortion. Uh, then the Ten Commandments were taken out. Uh, you know, now they have this crazy uh, lesbian mayor in uh, in Houston who is, uh, you know, taking all the uh, pastors to, to court for uh, preaching against uh, 
the homosexual agenda. Um, I mean, America is now a kind of country where they spit on the flag, they spit on the soldiers, they spit on the Ten Commandments, they spit on anything Judeo-Christian. And uh, what I think is going to happen is that God has sent us ISIS and Islam in order basically to kick us in the butt and make us wake up. And so I think that, uh, and I think one of the signs of the revival is, forgive me for saying it, is the creation of the Tea Party. I speak a lot to Tea Parties. Uh, I don't agree with a lot of things uh, they say, I, I, because I, I come out and correct them when I speak. Uh, but I think that the Tea Party represents a, an earnest, uh, truthful, and heartfelt, uh, um, um, how shall I say, direction in which the American people are going to be going. Uh, America will return to its Christian roots, or it will be destroyed of God. Uh, I, and so I work all the time. I'm a Jew who works for a Christian revival, hoping that America will come back to its common sense and uh, return to its Bible roots. And a lot of that applies to the Jewish people, too, in America. A lot of Jewish people have become uh, liberal, which I consider a sickness, and uh, they don't understand uh, what is right and what is wrong, what is up and what is down. Jews and Christians share this the sickness of uh, liberalism, which, uh, not liberalism, liberalism with a capital L, because the true liberals are the people who listen to any idea, uh, compare them, think about it. The true liberals are the Bible-believing Christians and the Orthodox Jews. Um, so, uh, I want, by the way, with speaking of the, uh, of the uh, Speaking of the uh, tea party, there was something I wanted to share, which I consider very important. You know, I go to tea parties, and the first thing I start out with at the tea party, how many people here, raise your hand if you think the dollar is going to collapse. All the hands go up. Raise your hand if you think that the U.S. economy is going to collapse. Everyone's hand goes up. And I say, listen, you could be right, but I think there's another thing we need to think about. And what is that? And that is that you are owned... Your, your, your debt is owned by the, uh, the Chinese and also by the Saudis, the Islamic world. They have an interest not to let America go under. And not only that, if, if Saudi Arabia wants to make America the greatest Islamic country on earth, which Obama says it is, and if Saudi Arabia wants to make uh, America Muslim, then what it has to do is bring into America 50 to 100 million Muslims. Uh, now, when you bring 50 to 100, I'll, in a moment I'll explain how they're going to do it. But uh, let's say that this is the plan and everyone understands what I'm saying is logic. Once you bring 50 million to 100 million in, you must make houses for them. There are simply not 50 to 100 million houses for these people. Now, when you have a housing boom to build these houses, then the whole American economy takes off. Uh, the dollar will be stronger than ever. The American economy will be stronger than ever. And guess who is going to get the call to credit? Obama. Now, what has happened, and I want to be very clear about this, um, you know, America used to be a Judeo-Christian country. When I was born in 1949 in New York, uh, America was a Judeo-Christian country where there were 6 million Jews and the rest were Christians. Today, there are 6 million Jews and 30 million Muslims. So you see, the Jews wow. are a poor third. The Hindus are, are almost 6 million. Um, by the way, Hindus are not enemies. Nobody's an enemy. Just, just this Islamic uh, ideology. So anyway, so... You have 9 million Iranians, 7 million Arab uh, Sunnis, you've got 4 million Farrakhans, that's 20 million. We haven't counted yet the Bosnians, the Albanians, the, the um, uh, Somalis, uh, Indonesians, uh, Muslims from India, Muslims from Africa, Muslims from Russia. Uh, this country has, I believe, 30 million. Uh, this country, the United States, uh, is empty. Uh, there's plenty of room for another 50 to 100 million. And because uh, Turkey is going to join the European Union, Turkey is not only 70 million Anatolian Turks. Turkey is 70 million Anatolian Turks and 200 million Soviet Turks. And these people all have the right to claim Turkish citizenship. When Turkey joins the European Union, you everybody's got to abandon where they live and move to Europe. So Europe will go from 300 uh, million uh, non-Muslims uh, and from 50 million Muslims in Europe today to 320 million Muslims altogether. Uh, in other words, the Christians will be outnumbered. Uh, they'll be the minority from the first moment that Turkey joins the European Union. Now, if you have 620 people, forget about the religion for a moment, uh, the United States has a problem, because the United States then will have to push forward with NAFTA, which will mean uh, uh, Canada, Mexico, another 150 million. Uh, America, Canada, Mexico becomes 500 million. But you're still short 120 million. So what do you do? You bring in these kids from Central America and their parents, 
the six republics of Central America joined Mexico and NAFTA. Uh, so now all of a sudden you have the North American bloc versus Europe. It will be Europe 620 million and uh, North America, including Central America, 520 million. You're still short 100 billion people. How do you get 100 billion people? Very simple. You create an Arab Spring. Uh, in the Middle East, you create complete devastation, destroy the economy, the Muslims starve, they kill their Christians and they starve, and then they look at each other, well, what are we doing here? Let's go to America, where we have a Muslim president waiting for us. So you will get 100 million Muslims. Uh, you know, I drive all over Texas and Arkansas and Missouri and uh, Oklahoma. These places are completely empty. Uh, you have room easily for 100, 150 million new people. And immigration, that's another thing. I asked the, the Tea Party people, how many people think immigration is a bad thing? Everyone's hand goes up. They said, no. I said, immigration is good. Immigration gives you the numbers to build up your GDP. <laughs> so everybody looks at me like it's crazy. But they invite me <laughs> back. Well, that's good. M my goodness. Uh, l let me ask you this question, because I did hear your September 2012 interview uh, with Rick Wiles. In fact, uh, after we talked, I listened to it. Um, Obama is a big part of this agenda. Uh, you had said on Rick Wiles, Obama was placed into office or is in office for three specific reasons. You want to touch on that? Because And, and folks, we're going to have Avi back when he's got more time, but you, you want to touch on that, on Obama's role in all this? Well, uh, firstly, uh, I want to share, share one or two things my wife picked up uh, in her work. 2006, two years before the 2008 victory of Obama, uh, the Saudis were saying, we will have a Muslim president in the White House in 2008. And my wife fell off her chair. So these, these Saudis are completely crazy. I mean, nobody knew who Obama was because he was just elected a few months before in the Senate, and he really wasn't known for anything, and all of a sudden he becomes the president. This was engineered. Okay. Then you know, of course, and I recommend to everyone listening to this show, to go to this YouTube, Saudi Plant, P-L-A-N-T, Saudi Plant. This was done by a Southern Baptist pastor in Florida. He, I, he didn't even talk to us before. He made it. All of a sudden, my son said to me, this went viral, and uh, there were two and a half million hits. Now it's like almost five million hits. Um, so five million people know who me and my wife are. Uh, anyway, so my wife picked up a broadcast where Obama swore to the Egyptian foreign minister in Egypt in 2009 that he was a Muslim, that his father from Kenya was a Muslim, which makes him a Muslim, that his stepfather, Sotoro, in Indonesia was a Muslim, that he was raised in a mosque and in a madrasa until age 11 as a Muslim, which makes him a Muslim, and that he had Obamacare and economic problems uh, that they had to deal with first, but after he took care of those things, he would show the Islamic world what he was going to do to Israel, meaning destroy Israel. Wow. Now, the, the sure. three things that Obama, the three commands that he has to fulfill for the king of Saudi Arabia is, number one, destroy the Shiite regime in Iran, number, and replace it with the UN regime, UN-backed regime, which will be pro-Saudi. Secondly, destroy Israel. Thirdly, destroy Christian America, make it Muslim. So uh, if you follow what's going on with Iran, uh, Obama is doing everything he can to lift the sanctions, to make nice and make kumbaya with the Iranians, and eventually what it means is Israel is going to have no choice but to go it alone. Uh, Obama wants Israel and Iran to duke it out. Uh, Obama wants Israel to be destroyed by Iran and the Shiite regime to be destroyed by the Israeli Air Force. Um, probably that would start a rebellion of youth, uh, like an Arab Spring, a Persian Spring, let's call it that. Uh, but Israel would be destroyed. Israel is a very small country, and uh, Iran probably has enough weaponries already to do it. Um, and then he would be smelling roses because Obama did not uh, send any boots on the ground there. And uh, then he would be able to focus on the American economy, uh, bring in 100 million Muslims, bring in the money from Saudi Arabia, let Saudi Arabia buy out all the banks, corporations, and all companies, uh, you know, the building industries. Um, and basically, America becomes a Saudi colony. Uh, everything is terrific as long as you agree to become a Muslim. If you become a Muslim, sell your soul to the devil, you're going to enjoy it at first. And then comes ju Judgment Day. Wow. And, and, and very nicely said, very succinctly said, by the way. Um, uh, all right. Uh, Avi, I know that uh, any time now we can, get, we can get cut off. 
And folks, we will have Avi back, uh, you know, with, with, a, with better connection, and of course, a longer period. Avi, uh, we saw what happened in Quebec today, or I'm sorry, in uh, Ottawa today, with respect to the uh, shooting the, uh, uh, by the terrorist. How does this fall into what's going on if it does? Well, uh, listen, you had the Fort Hood incident in which 13 uh, soldiers were killed by this Colonel Hassan. Um, and, of course, to this day, from what I understand, American soldiers uh, who were injured uh, are not being recognized by the U.S. government for exactly what it was. Uh, and they cannot get the treatment they need because the President uh, Obama said calls it a workplace incident, not what it really is, which is Islamic terrorism. Um, uh, you have the British soldier being beheaded in the streets of London by these two crazy Muslims. Uh, why should we be surprised? They're doing the most outrageous things uh, in the Middle East. Uh, you know that Russia is also having a major war. It has been having a major war with the Muslims for a thousand years. Russia has been fighting the Sunni Muslims for a thousand years. And these Chechens, remember the bombing in the, in the Boston with the marathon? Oh, yeah. Well, these Charnayev yeah. brothers, the Charnayev brothers, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but there were three Jewish high school, I'm not going to excuse me, three Jewish college kids. And one day, the Boston police found them with their throat slit, and their bodies were covered with cocaine powder. But strangely enough, the wallets were not stolen. And then it turned out later that the Charnaya brothers slit the throats of these three Jewish kids uh, because they were Jewish. And uh, uh, these are um, uh, Sunni Muslims from Chechnya, from Russia. And Russia warned the United States and the United States of all their Muslims and Homeland Security, of course, looked the other way. So what you have in U.S. Uh, Homeland Security and uh, the FBI, the CIA, the NSA now, is that you're getting more and more Muslims whose job is to run interference and not allow the American Christians and Jews uh, to uh, detect the, the terrorism and stop it. Gotcha. Wow. Man, that, uh, okay. They, all, all of this, uh, folks, you know, if, if we can connect the dots, and we are connecting the dots. Obviously, actually helping us do that. Um, in the larger picture, by the way, and I know, uh, Avi, that the connection will be tenuous now. I can, we can hear it uh, drifting away. Um, hopefully you can hear us all right. Uh, Avi, what, uh, what would you expect with, respect, with, res with regard to the uh, U.S.-Iranian relationship? We have just heard today that U.S. and Iran have been meeting secretly, have been inking out perhaps deals in secret. Does this surprise you at all? I, I, I just shared about this. I said that Obama wants to lift the sanctions. He doesn't want a military confrontation. And if the Iranians get, get nuclear weapons, so what? You know, so be it. And besides, they're going to use it on Israel, which Obama wants to destroy it anyway. Okay, that, that was the context. I was okay. I apologize. Yeah, you did. You did say no, that. It's okay. I, I lacked it's okay. the. Okay. This is maybe um, it's good, it's good that you emphasize it because this is the most important thing. Not ISIS. Iran is the most important threat at this moment in the Middle East to the whole world because once they start getting 38 nukes every year, uh, they're going to be using it against the Saudis. And uh, by the way, in my third book, Islamic Threat Updates Almanac, there's an article there, which is of great embarrassment to the U.S. government uh, that the Saudis have a Chinese-built missile base at the Al Salai Oasis in Saudi Arabia. The Chinese have provided 120 Dong Feng missiles, and they are nuclear tipped, courtesy of Abdul Qadir Khan, the father of the Pakistani uh, nuclear project. So Saudi Arabia already has 120 nukes. Uh, you know, the U.S. government never talks about it; it's not in the media. But uh, this is something we got from Israeli intelligence. Uh, so why should the Iranians not have nukes? Oh wow! Uh, which book is that, Avi? Your is Tell me again the title of the book that you wrote that, that it's in. It's called, it's called Islamic Threat Updates. And uh, okay. this book is also available on my 800 number and also on my website. I've written six books on all, all of these different subjects. So uh, do you want me to get the number out? Uh, please, well, uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Okay. If people want to call on an 800 number, it's 1-800-540-0828. one 800 Five four zero zero eight two eight. Uh, the book was written under my pen name, Victor Mordecai. Uh, they offer all six of my books. Uh, if people want book CDs, DVDs, then they need to go to the website, vicmord.com, B-I-C-M-O-R-D.com, which I understand you have a link to on your website. 
That, that is correct, sir. Um, okay, in the waiting moments we have you, uh, Avi, take us wherever you want to take us uh, in, in the short little spurt minutes that we've got. Well, uh, all I can say is I am a follower of the Harvard professor, Samuel Huntington. Uh, a lot of people get very angry when I mention that name uh, because there are a lot of people who believe that there's no such thing as a, an international uh, uh, cultural crisis between nations, class of civilization. And I say that there is a class of civilizations. Uh, the Muslims are definitely uh, in opposition to Judeo-Christian Western civilization and democracy. Uh, they're also in opposition to Chinese culture or Indian culture, um, anything which is not Islamic. Um, but the point I'm saying is Americans must get educated. They have to get educated about what is Judeo-Christian Western civilization and democracy. Uh, and they also have to understand what is the anti-culture, what is the, the, the conflicting uh, anti-culture, which is against the Judeo-Christian Western civilization. And uh, like I said very early in the interview, uh, slavery uh, was abolished in 1863 by President Lincoln. Uh, slavery has never been abolished uh, in Africa. And Africa is a, a, a country very much ridden by slavery. Islam is a system of slavery. There is no democracy. Women have no rights. And I can't understand how there, are, there is such a thing as women from the Western countries uh, running over to Islam. Uh, it, it really boggles the mind. Uh, Avi, uh, switching gears here, I wanted to get your thoughts on Assad. Do, we, do you think that Assad will be removed uh, in a regime change sooner rather than later? Or is he going to continue to hold out, or, or is this ISIS threat being used as a uh, countermeasure to to go uh, and bring more um, forces against the Assad regime and trying to remove it from power? Yes, and I would say another thing also. I um, now I'm not taking sides here. You know, I'm not pro Assad at all. Assad's a horrible person. He has a killing machine there. Uh, only God knows how many people have died uh, because of Assad. But what I see happening is, I see as the bottom line, uh, a war, an inevitable war between Israel and Iran. Uh, if the United States turns its back on Israel and turns its back on Iran, uh, it, it, Israel will have to go by itself and uh, deal with this nuclear threat. The nuclear project cannot just be left alone. Um, and uh, like I said before, Obama wants to abandon Israel so that Israel will do it alone so that it will be destroyed. But what I'm saying is once uh, is, uh, Iran goes through the turmoil of a post-attack, uh, you know, after such an attack, I believe there will be riots in the streets of Iran. Uh, the Iranian people are not a bad people. The Iranian people, uh, actually many of them like Israel, like the Jews. They're very pro-West. The Shah was pro-Western until stupid president Jimmy Carter brought it down. Um, once Iran goes into its own turmoil, Bashar al-Assad is left alone. And Hezbollah is already, which is also Shiite, is also beginning to taste the bitter pill uh, of a Sunni invasion of Lebanon, uh, which is coming to get them and the Christians and the Druze. So what I see happening eventually is that the Sunni forces, the ISIS forces, uh, will dominate and will take over these countries. Um, uh, you know, Russia, I'm sad to say, you know, Russia uh, should not be seen as an enemy. Uh, I think that Putin, of course, is uh, overplaying his hand with uh, the Ukraine. Uh, the Ukraine has a very horrible history uh, towards the Jews. Uh, the Jews are actually closer to Russia uh, historically. The Russians were also not very good to the Jews. But uh, the point I'm saying here is that Russia is actually defending this minority group known as the Shiites. The Shiites are only 15% of Islam. The Sunnis are 85%. So what I see happening uh, inevitably, I'm afraid to say, is a Sunni victory in Syria, a Sunni victory in uh, Iraq. I think that uh, what we know as ISIS, uh, uh, the backbone of ISIS today are, are not crazy fanatic Muslims. Uh, the, the backbone of ISIS are the Iraqi Republican Guards who the U.S. refused to give jobs. And these people are professional soldiers. So if the U.S. didn't give them jobs, they joined ISIS. So these people are already inside Baghdad. And they know Baghdad because they ruled over it. So there's going to be a tremendous blood pass uh, in Iraq. I think they're going to attack the American embassy in Iraq, which is the biggest embassy in the world. Uh, Lebanon is going to have another civil war. Uh, the whole Middle East is depopulating because of this civil war. 
and uh, anyone who believes in the Bible should go ahead and read Second Chronicles chapter 20, because Second Chronicles chapter 20 describes a parallel history that happened in Jerusalem, or near Jerusalem, uh, 3,600, 3,700 years ago, uh, where the enemies of Israel basically destroy each other. So today, the enemies of Israel, the Sunnis and the Shiites, they're destroying each other. Uh, of course, the United, States, the United States and the world is blaming Israel for everything, but uh, God basically is doing what God's going to do, and he says to, to Israel, you sit back and relax. I'm, I'm going to do the fighting for you. Wow. Okay. And, and that's, using, that's very clear. Go ahead. I think he's using the insanity of Islam for the Muslims to kill each other. And I'm not happy about Muslims killing each other. I want you to know, I want to emphasize this. I don't know if there are any Muslims listening right now to your show. I'm sure there are. I love the Muslims. I married a woman from Egypt who's Jewish, but I married her because of her Arabic culture. And I love the Arabic culture. I always thought of myself as Lawrence of Arabia. And my mother said to me, rest in peace, she said, you know, you're not Lawrence of Arabia, you're Avi of the Negev. You know, the desert of the south of Israel. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but, but, you know, I don't hate the Arabs, I love them, but I cry for them. They're killing each other. Why are they killing each other? Because their God is Satan, their God is the devil, and their God is killing them. Ah, man, I'll tell you. Uh, uh, all right, uh, Avi, you're, you're starting to break up now, and I, I have a feeling we're not going to have much more time left with you. Um, how soon do you, do you see the conversion, the full conversion, or the, the final blow to the United States here? And, and you can explain all of this in greater detail when you come back with us and spend more time. But um, has Obama, uh, I mean, he's got two years left. Can he, can he do all of this in the two years that he's got left? Well, regardless of Obama, I think that if ISIS does what I think it's going to do in Saudi Arabia, which is to blow up the oil wells, then I think the one world government agenda will put an end to the ISIS, will put an end to Islam, and the oil wells will be secured by international forces because the world economy cannot tolerate this insanity to continue. So I, I uh, would not, never say, I would never say, I, I, know, I see a happy end to that part of the story, that, you know, that America uh, would never convert to Islam. And uh, I say the contrary, the Muslims who come here have to think very seriously about whether or not they want to stay in this country. And if they want to stay in this country, they must become Christian. Okay. And, and it's interesting because I heard you mention this with Rick Wiles. A, a part of the uh, Muslim infiltration into America is complements of Agenda 21 programs. Correct. Correct. In other words, uh, uh, the, the U.N. issues an international emergency call uh, to receive 100 million uh, refugees, most of which go to the States. Um, and that the, all the governments, U.S., Canada, European governments, Australia, uh, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, have plenty of room uh, for these people. The money will be provided by the Saudis for this uh, uh, humanitarian influx, Islamic influx. And then Islam uh, eventually becomes the law of the land, because if you go against Islam, they'll chop your head off. Yeah, yeah. And not, not a very pleasant thought. But, but Islam it will be the essentially, at least initially, the uh, backbone to this new world order, political, religious, and even well, the, at least a political and religious structure of the new world order until it's of no use anymore. Is that is that kind of what you're saying as well? Exactly, exactly, exactly. The useful idiot did what he was supposed to do, and then he's terminated. And by the way, you know, I, many times uh, I'm in churches and people ask me, is Obama the Antichrist? I say the Antichrist will come out of the Western system to terminate Islam. Wow. Okay. Do you feel, and I know this is not exactly, um, this calls for speculation, but with respect to the Antichrist, uh, are, are you looking toward uh, the London area, the, uh, the, the, that, uh, that part of the world, or are we looking at something more in the uh, Persian area, we'll say? I would say that it would be from the Western world, the Christian world. It would be a leader who brought peace to the earth. Uh, uh, somebody who can come and say that he is God because he brought peace to the earth and he really did it. And the only way to do that is to ban Islam. Islam will be banned because it's going to be so outrageous, the kind of stuff. When millions of people die from 9-11 attacks, let me tell you, even the biggest liberals are going to turn uh, arch-conservative. Uh, so whoever can lead that coalition, that league of Western nations and uh, cultures to terminate Islam uh, and then bring peace and stability to the world economy, uh, that's the guy who's going to get up one day in Jerusalem and say, I'm God, you know. I, I, by the way, I, I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask. 
a lot of people ask me, when, when are you just going to build the third temple? And, uh, you know, I say, you know, we can't touch the mosque. So as long as the mosques are there, there won't be a third temple. So once I was in the church in Springfield, Missouri, and the pastor said, burn it down, burn it down right now. And uh, he got fired from his church for saying that. But really? what's going to huh. happen is the, mos- the mosques will go when the Blackstone and Mecca go. The Blackstone and Mecca will go when the world decides that they've had enough of Islam. You destroy the black stone, you've terminated Islam. You, you've, you've taken out one of the five pillars of Islam, the Hajj. And once that's gone, then Muslims will realize that their God is a loser. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the greater God. Is this, I call this an Elijah moment. An Elijah moment, and very aptly worded. Um, Avi, out of fairness to you, uh, you are kind of breaking up at this point, and uh, we're we're at the top of the hour. Uh, we do have a do we have a date by the way next Monday perhaps if you can swing it? Yes, I'm going to uh, make every effort for this coming Monday, more or less the same hour. All right, all right, Mr. Lipkin, uh, because of your geographical challenges here and, and our challenges that now beginning to uh, try to understand and hear you, we will cut you loose, but uh, what a fantastic, what an informative first hour of our program. Mr. Lipkin, uh, thank you for your time. Travel. God bless you and God save America and Israel. A- Amen. Amen. And, and have a great, uh, have a great uh, uh, presentation tonight and again, safe travels. Folks, that was Avi Lipkin. Uh, please bookmark his website, vicmord.com. That's vicmord.com. Of course, that's the alias, uh, Victor Mordecai. He is a fantastic author. He's a fantastic researcher. Uh, thanks for that. Yeah, but man, I'll tell you, it, it just was getting really bad toward the end there um, with respect to the packet loss and, and, and not being able to hear. I, I don't know if, if if you could hear, if the listeners could hear the, uh, yeah, the static. distortion. And distortion continued to get worse wow. and worse as, uh, as he was traveling further and further. So it's probably a good yeah. time to, to reach the top of the hour break anyway, uh, as I don't think it would have lasted much longer trying to stay on and have a conversation. But, but you know, it was interesting, hey, folks. He had uh, he had done well. He had said a lot of things with respect to uh, Islam, it being a criminal psychosis greater than the Nazi regime and, and I and I do believe that. I, have we not been really saying that but perhaps not as eloquently as, as uh Mr. Lipkin and Mr. Lipkin is one that understands the greater, the bigger picture. And did you notice how he had framed the um the bigger picture? And, and it, it, it's kind of interesting to get his take, Joe, on ISIS, where he says ISIS is a good thing. Uh, at, at least to as an awakening, but I think that that advances, of course, the judgment day. I, 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 the greater that ISIS becomes, and kind of follow my logic on this, the greater that ISIS becomes, the more the West will have to deal with this directly, and of course that will, in fact, to, to me anyway, accelerate the playbook the globalist playbook but very interesting more on the other side as we get into the events of today in ottawa and how that relates to things i was talking to steve quayle earlier today about that and um he's got yeah, there, thoughts on that was it a uh, canadian soldier was gunned down as well as the gunman who entered the canadian parliament building which is um about the same as our Capitol building, which you explained to me earlier. And we had uh, it, this uh, Canadian Parliament in Ottawa was on lockdown. This was just two days after a uh, terror attack in Quebec. The shots rang out just before 10 a.m. when a guard at the National War Monument was fatally shot. The gunman ran into the Parliament Hill building where one MP reported hearing as many as 30 shots fired, and a sergeant at arms was later credited with shooting the suspect dead in the following moments and hours. Royal Canadian Mounted Police converged on the scene. More were reported less than a mile away near the mall, and officials told Ottawa residents to barricade themselves in their home as they searched for more possible gunmen. At a news conference hours later, authorities described a dynamic, a dynamic situation and could not confirm whether more potential gunmen were at large, although they said no arrests had been made. 
And we're going to get into that story and others on the other side of the break. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to hour number two of this Wednesday edition of the Hagman and Hagman Report. Great first hour. If you missed it, catch the rebroadcast. We had an interview about one hour long with Mr. Avi Lipkin, a uh, very distinguished speaker. And hold on, I'm trying to get my audio fixed here. My dad's saying I'm having problems. How's this? How's this? Any better? Yeah, yeah a little bit. That's yeah. Uh, it doesn't sound like you're underwater. Okay. Um, anyway, I don't know. Uh, we're, Mr. Lipkin was on. We were talking about things pertaining to the uh, conflict with ISIS, the Arab Spring, the future of uh, the Iranian uh, Israel situation, and U.S. Israel relations, and a lot more. Hopefully, um, not set in stone yet. But next Monday. Mr. Lipkin plans to come back on, and if not Monday, we will set a date uh, and time for him to come back on. As you, he, you know, Joe, uh, J- J- when you arrived at the studio today, I've got to tell you, I was on the phone with him, and he was giving me his schedule. We were trying to pick a day where he can. I, I said, Avi, you know, do you want to do the full three hours? He said, I, Yeah, I want to do five hours. Uh, I was just impressed, and, and folks, you could tell how fast he thinks and talks and his delivery spot on. Of course, he's been doing this for a while. I think he's been in, um, I, I, I don't know, uh, just about every state here this this year, perhaps more than once. He'll be in Gettysburg, I think, next month or at the end of this month, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, which is not too far. It's only a couple of hundred miles from us. I mean, that would be great to, you know, to, to, to see him. But he's got one of the most uh, incredible schedules of anyone I've ever seen. And if you've ever seen him in person, we met him in Orlando. And if you've ever seen him in person, you talk about a ball of energy. I just hope that uh, that I have that that much energy. Uh, what do you see? What do you say? He was 66 years old, right? Man, I'll tell you, fantastic. But the knowledge that he does have with respect to, to uh, uh, global affairs is just beyond the pale. So I want to thank Avi uh, for his assessment on things. But one of the things, Joe, you were talking about before the break is the is what happened in Ottawa today. Um, I, when I was talking to Steve Quell, you know, he said, "Look, uh, um, it, it just smells like one of those um, engineered type of events, a false flag kind of event." And when, when we say false flag, of course, you, you've got to understand the the all encompassing terminology that that does suggest, but isn't everything headed toward um, a virtual societal lockdown? I mean, whether we talk about Ebola or ISIS, is, isn't, doesn't that seem like the, every event that we're seeing take place right now, doesn't it seem like it, it is advancing us, marching us toward a societal lockdown? That's my question. Joe, do you, do you have that same assessment, or is that you have something different in, in your research on what happened today? No, they are, um, what they're doing is, is running, uh, using crises and running experiments or uh, exercises to bring about the emergency uh, preparedness guidelines. And there are, I have to go through some of the documents I have, but there is a new document released by the Army. Yeah, this is fascinating, folks. Please uh, listen to what Joe's got to say about this. You grab the the paper off the printer there. Those are some bullet points. There's a a document from 2014 of June uh, uh, titled Multi-Service Tactics, Techniques, and Procedures for Installation Emergency Management. Now, this goes on. It's a 134-page document that really lays out in details every aspect of uh, our emergency response civilian aspect to the government aspect, whether it's DOD, FEMA, DHS, uh, etc., to their resources, their um, abilities, their missions, their, and it's all depending on the type of scenario that they are going to be, I guess, responding to. But they have a number of uh, potential and non-dangerous simulations and and, uh, situations that could happen 
where we find ourselves uh, being resettled, being um, put into an emergency response situation where we do you remember the resettlement reoperations and uh, operations and resettlement released about a year ago? Were yeah, they? You're, you're breaking up again, by the way. That's strange. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'll check my connection here. You go ahead and and talk for a minute while I fix All right. these headphones. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure what's going on, folks. If you could hear that, it sounded like he was underwater. Um, but he's he's doing he's doing some checking. What, what Joe found was was a Department of Defense Operations manual, procedural manual, that dovetails or that um, basically um, captures or lays out the lays out what the government would do or will do in the event of a crisis or multiple crises. The mm -hmm. timing I find it awful strange. It's 134 pages. Once, in fact, you can send me the link and, and I'll, I'll put it up in the, uh, I'll put it on Hagman and Hagman com. I, I promise I will, so people can peruse this document. I think it's rather interesting by its implications. But let me take you back, um, since I had mentioned Rick Wiles and Avi Lipkin back from September 2012, when uh, Rick Wiles interviewed Avi Lipkin. In I sent it to the studio. For you. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, after the show tonight, I'll put it up on on Hagman and Hagman dot com. But one of the things I found interesting when when you showed me this document, Rick Wiles, last I think it was two days ago. It was on the. Uh, uh, it was from uh, October twentieth, so that would be yeah, two days ago. Uh, was talking about uh, the Tom Clancy uh, game video game called The Division. Folks, have you heard about this? This is based on Operation Dark Winter, and it, uh, it, 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 it's really, it kind of overlays or has some tentacles into the continuity of government in the event of an emergency. It's a, simula it's a simulation. And I, I thought of this when you showed me this paper, and I began to look at this this document, this this 134-page uh, PDF. So, yeah. having said all of that, okay, now, and, and, and just to close my thought here, having said all of this, if you look at what's taking place in the world today, and think about Tom Clancy, and, and you know whether or not um, I, I've got my doubts about about certain people dying at certain times, whether it's you know what if they have died from natural causes or something else i do believe in the case of Tom Clancy you've got to look at <laughs> you've got to look at all of his information all of his contacts and you just have to ask the question which is a terrible thing to do today having to ask the question was it in fact death was his death as stated and that's just merely a question it's not an accusation it seems rather convenient based on some of the things that we're seeing now coming out, such as this new video game called The Division. And, the, and Rick Wiles played the commercial or the um, promotion for this video game. And I've got to tell you, if you listen to that or listen to the Rick Wiles broadcast from October 20th of this year, with particular emphasis on the uh, that particular video game, I do believe you're going to see some overlap and overlay of an agenda. And, and by the way, it was during the same broadcast when he did mention the 4,000 troops being sent to Western Africa. And I had the gracious opportunity or the opportunity to talk to the very gracious Maria Canis, author of Prepare for Persecution, which is a book uh, on our website, uh, uh, linked off of our website. Folks, if you haven't had the opportunity to read that, grab a, grab a copy from Amazon and read that. But during that conversation, uh, we were talking about the 4,000 troops that Obama had dispatched to Western Africa with little or no training, what, only a few hours of training for Ebola and the in insufficient, knowingly insufficient um, gear, and then bringing them back. Well, Rick Wiles shares author Maria Canisa's opinion that Obama, there's malicious intent there. And uh, it's to it, it's a militarization or a, to milit militarize our response 
to Ebola. Now, what's next? And again, overlapping with the video game called The Division. Can you see this coming when we look at the bigger picture with the with the DOD manual that Joe found and the continuity of government and operation, civilian uh, coordination and um, emergency management plans? But can you just picture this? Perhaps money becomes contaminated. Perhaps the powers, the global elite, the people in charge of the finances will say, well, we found that money, that currency, you know, the uh, via dollars that we are exchanging using for money are being contaminated. So, or are, are contaminated with, with the Ebola virus or some mutation thereof or some other virus. So what a way to switch to digital currency. The relationship between that and Tom Clancy's, the video game based on Tom Clancy's uh, work called The Division, interestingly, has parallels. So having said all that, Joe, I'm going to kick it back to you, and uh, you tell me what your right. biggest concern about this. Well, after uh, literally years of research, uh, and I don't know how many days' worth of hours of reading, weeks' worth of hours of reading, seemingly useless documents, um, putting together what uh, I've read briefly out of this Army document that was just released, we have, after 9-11, implemented uh, a number of national uh, preparedness uh, from the uh, NLE. Uh, I think that was the national, I'm not sure that was the electric electronic um, preparedness, but they have the, the federal health architecture. They have the um, emergency um, management and this is what this document is referring to, the installation of the emergency management plan. And the emergency management plan is consists of a few uh, things. One is the response to the emergency, um, resource management, um, evacuation, shelter. Uh, they also talk about communications and uh, a number of other uh, things you know. Uh, when, when is this? When was this published or made public, or when was this drafted? This document that you're, you're this one was, was drafted in this year uh, of June, June of this. Year. But it follows uh, a document that was released in 2011. This is uh, the Center for Biologics and Electronic. What is this? S uh, C B Center for Biolog Biologics uh, Evaluation and Research. This is from the Health and Human Services. Now, there's uh, they say it's CBER, and then there is another uh, four-letter acronym that starts with a C that's separate from this. That's also part of this. But in this 2011 document, which was the strategic plan for 2012 to 2016, they state this, that they're going to uh, launch an initiative agency-wide to foster rapid electronic exchange of information between private healthcare databases, the FDA surveillance systems, and the ability to collect and analyze, communicate information more efficiently. Now, through this, they're, we're going to do a number of things. They say that to enhance this active electronic safety monitoring system to strengthen their ability to monitor performance of medical products, also for public health safety. They were going to do so through a, uh, a range of emergency management uh, exercises, as well as capitalizing on actual crises. They st stated in this document <clears throat> that after two years after this document be released, that another document be released, and all the time periods uh, go from 2016 to 2019 to the uh, is the very end from what I've seen. Now this national preparedness system includes presidential uh, directives, homeland security uh, directives, the continuity of government plan, as you stated or you talked about, the um, emergency 
functions that would continue in case of a government emergency. You know how they have the, the backup system. They want to, right. under their stated goals, maintain an effective government, maintain effective uh, communications with foreign governments in times of uh, complete you know, crisis and chaos when our government seemingly is out, out of control. But this also is being used to create what is the um, known today as the uh, new electronic health record and their goals. This is what is being implemented and, through their right. through this emergency plan uh, management plan. And as I said, I didn't have a lot of time to go through this document to go back with other documents that I have read through to put them all together. I literally have a stack of about a thousand papers sitting in front of me. I'll just say this: in the new document, <clears throat> this is it's stated more clearly and plainly in this document than in any other document that I've read. It talks about establishing and requiring all people of any uh, organization or you know, private or public, civil or government, to and integrate themselves into a health threat surveillance and detection system, a public health information database, and monitor medical systems and operations, health statuses of personnel, and of all the general population. It will be designed to collect information from all available sources, public and private sectors, to work in sustaining information, intelligence gathering activities necessary for assessing emerging health threats and information during an incident or to mitigate an incident. <clears throat> now, there are a lot of conditions in this Army document that have not been in other documents so plainly stated, uh, which we haven't laid out really the groundwork for, for this uh, Army document yet. Okay, but just before you continue with that, let me just re let me just reaffirm with the listening audience here. What you're listening to is an, an assessment of a document. It's titled "Multi-Service Tactics, Techniques, and Procedures for Installation Emergency Management." It is was published in June 2014, June of this year. The distribution was authorized only to U.S. government agencies and their contractors. The the manual or well, yeah, the information, due to the sense of the nature of the information contained in this manual, uh, of course, the distribution was limited, and, uh, of course, it says destruction notice. And, and this is not unusual, but destruction notice destroy any method that will prevent disclosure of contents or reconstruction of this document. And once more, this is from the headquarters Department of the Army, and, however, it's available. You can see it. It's available at the Army Knowledge Online database. It's armypubs.us.army.mil. But we will link to it. Um, and it's it's interesting too, Joe. This doc, as you said, this document builds upon yeah. all of the other documents and technical manuals. The government the 21st project. century right. digital government strategy the National Strategy for Biosurveillance, uh, the law that we talked about the other day that was just signed by the President, the amendment to the Social Security Act, improving Medic Medicare Post-Acute Transformation Act of 2014, or the Impact Act of 2014, where they will and have required, uh, as they state here, the standardization of patient data in accordance with subsection B, which states, Requiring data described in subsection A to be standardized and interoperable, so for allow the exchange of such data among post act care providers, uh, and it goes on to uh, further describe it um, as all patients to provide for the submission of standard patient assessment and electronic health records uh, to have to comply with these um, orders and it's going to be launched through pilot programs in the VA 
and for people with special needs or diseases. And there uh, it is, the Nursing VA. homes, via, yep, from there, that's going to continue to branch out. Plans for children. Do you want your children, uh, if they were to be kidnapped, is an Amber Alert good enough? How about knowing where they are right away? Uh, it's going to be a good thing. It's going to seem to be a good thing. And it would be a good thing if this earth was run by moral by, and uh, godly people. Not by the devil, correct. And unfortunately, whether or not this is the mark of the beast, <clears throat> um, I'm not going to take part in this. And in the Army document, it talks about the consequences of that. Yes, and I'd like you to get into that because you did mention something. And I don't know, was this a separate publication, a tandem publication, that talked about the difference? I'm sorry? It's, it should be on the notes that I printed out. The difference of the, uh, the first, the uh, covered persons or protected persons? Right. Yes. Uh, I was looking. I, I didn't. I didn't see that on the uh, bullet points here. But, 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 folks, what what this does spell out then? Uh, I, I wasn't sure if this was if it, this was contained in a different document, but it's in this document. What this does address? Uh, this recognizes that people will not, for example, acquiesce and, and take part in, in any electronic surveillance. In other words, take part in uh, being chipped or. Uh, whether they have a, one of those uh, array antennas for the skin or regardless. Yeah. Let's go over a little bit of this. Yeah, let's do this because I think this is of critical importance, especially today and knowing what we know. Go ahead. All right. Uh, and here's just some um, key points to this document. It says, the main goal of recovery is mission reconstitution and the restoration of essential operations operation uh, of capturing lessons learned and subsequent required revisions from the emergency management plan upon reassessment. The National Disaster Recovery Framework, published in 2001, was a long-term community recovery plan. It expands key ESF-14 concepts into a full framework of mitigation actions involving a lasting and often permanent reduction of exposure to probability of or potential loss from identified hazard. The goal is to reduce the impact of identified hazards and potential loss. They go on to state that the uh, essential operations, the critical infrastructure, and assigned personnel, government personnel, and private property uh, mitigation and ongoing process that feeds directly into the overall preparedness of the installation, and this will be accomplished through the implementation of sustainable development activities, vulnerability reduction measures, and hazard prevention efforts consistent with command guidance through the vulnerability assessment process. Okay, now, okay. now hold, hold that thought for a second, because you, you mentioned a year and you mentioned 2001 relative to this particular paper, lessons learned, right, from 2001, correct? No, there was the uh, or, National Disaster Recovery Framework okay. that was uh, established in 2001, correct? Now, here's, okay, here, here's some dot connecting for you and, and the listeners and, and, and wondering, well, this sounds like a, a pretty confusing situation. If you take this document that Joe's talking about, what happened in 2001? What, aside from obviously aside from the attacks of 9/11, well, Operation Dark Winter, which was a very senior, the, the Operation Dark Winter was the the code name for a senior level bioterrorist attack simulation. It was conducted in June of 2001. And it was designed to carry out a mock version of a covert, widespread smallpox attack on the United States. Now, think about that, Operation Dark Winter, although it was smallpox. The operation was focused on evaluating the, the response from a national emergency by different various agencies during the use of a biological weapon. Of course, again, into Operation Dark Winter, it was smallpox. What are we seeing today? We're seeing Ebola. 
being militarized in such a way where now, you know, we're sending troops to West Africa. Just keep that in the back of your mind as, as we go through this because we're connecting some dots here that I think may take you to an aha moment. Go ahead. All right, the next uh, part I highlighted was part, and I posted the link in the chat room. You can also go to publicintelligence.com and find the link right off the top there. The second part is 2.48, civilian coordination and interoperability. A major objective of preparedness efforts is to ensure mission integration and interoperability in response to emergent crises, uh, emergent crisis across functional and organizational lines between public and private organizations. This integration effort includes interagency coordination, procedures and resources with civilian counterparts. Now it goes on right from there, the next uh, section to say, the installation of this emergency management plan will be uh, the preparation, response, recovery operations. The plan assigns responsibility to organizations and individuals across all functions of the response communities, including assigned or attached personnel. The plans facilitate coordination with organizational plans in support with uh, areas such as LE. Now, let me go to the glossary here. LE stands for uh, the you can guess it. You can guess it. Well, they, they change it up so much. Uh, law enforcement. That's right. Okay, so uh, let's go through that again there. Um, what they're doing here Okay, in support of such areas as law enforcement, medical and public health, communications, logistics, physical security, intelligence support. Now, they, they have a, another uh, three or four acronyms. Um, but they say these plans are received annually, updated as needed, and incorporated in as lessons learned uh, for improvement in identifying during real life events, exercises, and risk management activities, and integrated through the, um, oh, what is that, the uh, Federal Register area, um, improving critical infrastructure, uh, cybersecurity infrastructure. <coughs> February 12, 2013, where it talks about the improving the uh, nation's critical infrastructure of during times of emergency, incorporating the emergency uh, preparedness plans that are in place, the uh, continuity of government, and uh, many other uh, agencies of the government to make sure that they can demonstrate in the face of the uh, fiercest national security challenges, uh, reliable functioning of our nation's critical infrastructure and to enhance our security and resilience in the face of these threats, whether it comes from environmental threats, uh, terrorist, economic, uh, public safety, security, privacy, or civil liberties. And, and let me just interject something here because I think this, if you look at this document or use this document as the backdrop for this Ebola, the abominable strain of Ebola that we're seeing here in the United States, if you think about how Obama is willfully and even criminally, I might add, Im importing the disease into the United States, the intent here is malicious, at least in my view. Um, now we are noticing certain language coming from the renegade in chief and his band of renegades out of the White House, the language that is mirroring the language in the document that Joe's talking about here. Um, we have the first military SWAT team, if you will, yeah. for Ebola. Okay. Once again, please look at what's taking place today through the language of the document that was published earlier this summer by the Department of the Army. And notice now, how everything's being centralized. I'm going to uh, take you back 
to another sentence of this critical cybersecurity infrastructure executive order where it states that the practices that will be implemented um, when need be this critical framework that is, uh, here it is, the baseline for the framework to reduce the cyber risk to critical infrastructure, the Secretary of Commerce, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the head of the cybersecurity framework will set standards, methodologies, procedures, and processes that align with business, technology, and that will approach the vulnerabilities of cyber risks. And the best standards, they say, will be implemented and also consistent with international standards, such as international standards that will advance objectives of this order and shall meet the requirements of the National Institute of Standards and Technology Act, the National Technology and Transfer Advancement Act of 1995, and it lists a number of other laws from there. Um, okay, and, and I, I just I don't want people to get confused because this is a, a pretty intense document. We are looking at the installation of an emergency management plan that essentially gathers up, centralizes the power, involves the military, and involves basically all of the enforcement agencies of the government to really to, to round up or to, to become involved in everything, including but not limited to health care, to, well, yeah. to name it, everything. Well, it, it, it starts with health care, and it goes to further talk about, uh, you know, your your economic um information. But last year, and, and this might be uh, what spawned the document from this June, last June, the Department of Health and Human Services released the Strategy and Implementation Plan for Advancing Regulatory Science for Medical Products, which it states that this strategy, uh, within a year of this strategy, they shall develop another strategy, an implementation plan, in order to promote public health and advance uh, innovation and in regulatory decision making, they will be based on five requirements for the plan listed. And these, uh, it goes on to say that the priorities and challenges in regulatory science, the FDA will identify the regulatory science, the uh, decision making about medical products, and the scientific gaps that impede the timely introduction of safe products. They talk about the next step being advancing regulatory science, addressing priority gaps. They talk about how they will adopt the provisions uh, for clear and measurable metrics, which will fill in the gaps. And it goes on to state that from fiscal years 2014 to 2016, Congress will advance priorities to fill gaps identified in this plan, integrate adopting advancing regulatory science and address regulatory science commitments under these four user agreements. The plan includes a description of metrics we will use for these future reports. And it starts off uh, very simply by saying that in today's world with the uh, increased risk and increased technology, and I'm paraphrasing, that the only way to ensure safety in the real world is to invent or develop scientific modes to uh, scientific modes to transport information in real time uh, on health information and emerging situations to health uh, about the public health to uh, public health providers. And they, they the need bureaucratic systems system that. Manner of doing that. Right, right. I, I didn't mean to over talk you, but ultimately what they're talking about is a, a, an expeditious way to communicate or to have communication between a physical human being, a, a physical body, to a central reporting agency or a data collection agency. And in order to do that, what do they have to do? They've got to outfit a person with some sort of electronic communication device. And what mm -hmm. they want to do. Okay, the only way to do this is going to be through some sort of invasive process um, based on this document as well as 
all other supporting documents, the only way to do this expeditiously in this manner is to create some sort of, dare I say it, chip. Or uh, some I'll sort say of, it. Okay. Because they all say right. it. New and, create new and improved uh, technology and approaches to enhance transitional uh, the trans- transitional potential of clinical data well, with the goal of reducing a number of to save time. They say that they will be able to better predict uh, human diseases, human pandemics, toxicity of, uh, and not to skip around, but in the law that we read the other day about the social amendment to the Social Security Act, it states in here that those people who, it says right here that the people who are in, uh, involved in this program that are not living the way the government or other people expect them to live will be basically on the hook for any extra uh, hospital visits they incur based on their uh, living, the way they live. They will be um, held accountable and pretty much intervened upon not being as healthy as they should. And I'm using my words, not theirs, but they right. <laughs> they say, right. and they use the word intervention. Um, and they talk about, uh, they they want, and I don't know if you saw that the United Nations just recently yeah. uh, went made into an agreement with the uh, tobacco. But, um, yeah, they say that people who are uh, healthy individuals or less, uh, here's what they say. Less healthy individuals may require more interventions. The study shall use information collected on such individuals in carrying out such programs as urban and rural location, eligibility for Medicaid, uh, accounting for various uh, benefits under supplemental security incomes, but that they will have to um, change their, their lifestyle, their behaviors, and their habits. They will have to follow a program. Not only will they have to go along with and get this uh, medical chip, but due to their uh, whatever it is that causes health problems, they will have to basically be ostracized, and they will have to improve their overall health data. Otherwise, you know, what they Bill Gates talked about was the death panels. It goes on to say Medicare will, uh, yeah, individuals uh, will require more interventions. They will use uh, federal data as necessary, and they will, the people who, it'll be like a probation. It'll be coordinated. Uh, you'll be put in like a special category uh, of people who have the chip, and you will be uh, intervened on. You'll have home visits like child services, and you will have uh, people telling you what you can eat, what you can't eat. Uh, you know, if you want to smoke, well, you're going to have to, you know, leave our system or get dropped from our health insurance. It's going to be an all-controlling system. And Avi said something in the first hour that I know he was driving, and, and he said that the New World Order, they want all the money. Well, that's partially true. They want the control of the money. It's not they the want actual the money. Right. And that's what they want with us here. It's not so much as they want our health information. They want the control of having our information. And in an executive order that the president gave, uh, one of his first, in November 24th of 20, or 2009, one of the sentences, uh, the executive order is, Establishing the Presidential Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, and it says this, that in support of this mission, there will be a commission that will examine issues to technologies, included but not limited to stem cells, intellectual property issues involving genetic sequencing, biomarkers, other screening tests used for risk assessments, the application of robo-sciences, It will also examine broader issues not linked 
two specific technologies, including but not limited to protection of human research participants, scientific integrity, and conflicts of interest in research, and the intersection of science and human rights. Now, what do we have to worry about in intersection? Where is science and human rights going to collide head to head? That's Executive Order 13-521. And there it is. But, I mean, there's so much more. Uh, and I was unprepared and didn't really plan on getting into this today, but, you know, it is so important because um, they're doing this right under our, our nose. Why, they ask, why uh, electronic health record implementation? Why should we do this? What are they accomplishing, they say? Well, they said that they can uh, do a lot of things. Through this implementation, they will be able to ensure good decision-making. They will be able to basically have a, a smart health system, like our smart meters or smart TVs or smartphones. They'll be allowed to track you. Oh, yeah, that, that's another thing from the Army document. One of the benefits, they list a number of benefits here. And one of those benefits is um, as follows. It says this plan is an important document for the support of the preparation, response, and recovery uh, to responsibility of organizations and individuals across functional response uh, assigned attached personnel. It goes on to say that this will be essential to public health and these plans are needed and incorporated into lessons learned opportunities for identifying real life events, exercises, and risk management activities. It goes on to say this, that the missions and goals will be uh, as follows. They'll be able to uh, reduce the risk of hazards and threats from disease that would otherwise go unnoticed without doctor visits at the right time. They would be able to uh, establish planning for your life and the health you will need, the health care you will need in your life to a great extent. They will have you set up so if something happens to you, you won't even need to dial 911. It'll be almost a self-emergency uh, uh, communication device. <laughs> it also goes on to say, uh, basically, if you needed to, it can be a personal uh, tracking uh, or monitoring device in case of a lost uh, family member as one of the benefits. And I thought that was comical because that's how they'll roll this out, like I said earlier, with right. the children. You know, you know well, what, you're, what kind of monster are you that you wouldn't want to send your child that you couldn't, wouldn't be able to find him if he was missing right away? Um, you know, it, it, it's, uh, what is it? The saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions, the devil's in the details. Those are a few uh, sayings that are very true. And through these stated goals that will and can help people, at the same time, they are used to our detriment. And, and you see, folks, this is not a new document. This is just one of, I'm sure thousands or if not tens of thousands that are buried within the within the libraries of these online publications and, and publications that are not necessarily in the forefront. People are not looking at, they're not reading. And we can go back to May 9th, 2007. If you take what we're referring to tonight with respect to the EOD document or the uh, U.S. military document, that addresses the civilian population and the the um this the generally speaking I, I suppose the consolidation of power the centralization of power in the event of emergency this addresses the civilian population well, what about our government go well, back to may ninth of two thousand and seven presidential directive fifty one which is nothing more than a blueprint or the architecture for dictatorship 
And this, of course, we have to look at this as a nonpartisan or something that transcends politics, partisan politics. This is not a Republican or Democrat thing or a conservative liberal issue. This is a globalist initiative that was put in that was signed by George W. Bush. I have it here if you want it. No, I mean people can look this up. It's it's what the presidential directive 51 does for the continuity of government and the centralization of power. These documents, the document that you're referring to, um, does that for the civilian population, but with the assistance of today's technology. And today's technology, of course, is you're looking at this rush to process. And if you have time, folks, if you can, I would urge everyone to go back and listen to last Saturday's program. Sheila Zelensky interviewed Catherine Albrecht. Uh, Joe, I think you were part of that conversation interview. I'm not, no, you weren't? Okay. Um, but she interviewed not Catherine one. Albrecht Okay, with spy chips, the spy technology. Right, and, and that's a great book. And she has uh, a book that is uh, for parents to help explain to their children about you know, not taking this, this mark or this chip. And what you refer to here is Presidential uh, Directive 51 is Part 1, a national con continuity policy, as you said, for civilian population, followed by the uh, continuity of government. Uh, part 2 right. being for the, the government's essential function uh, continuation during a national essential uh, emergency or a national level emergency. Well, and going back once again, uh, uh, making reference, and I'm going to thank Rick Wiles because he's done some tremendous research. But if, if you go back, for example, and listen to his show of of uh, two days ago, of uh, October 20th, if you if you listen to what he was talking about with respect to Tom Clancy, his uh, that particular game. By the way, the simulation was done. When in 2001, as I said, he makes he also makes message or mention of uh, presidential directive 51, the continuity of government. Take all of this together, all of this together. It seems like over the last, well, since 9/11, but especially over the last few years, what has happened over really since uh, 2007, 2008, since Bush's last year in office in Obama's first year in office, the centralization process, the consolidation of power, the elimination, for example, of states and, and other agencies is being cut off. Now we're seeing this perfect dictatorship forming. And I don't even know how, to, uh, how else to describe this, but a dictatorship. So, or at least at this point, at this moment, a dictatorship light, soon to be a full-blown dictatorship. I, I really don't know how else to describe what yeah. we're talking about. Well, you know, in, in reading and going through just giving this uh, Presidential Directive 51, it's it has all the key words in here. Uh, when you're talking about um, the uh, mitigation uh, mitigation and protection. When you're talking about the uh, post-market surveillance, when you hear these words uh, such as uh, critical infrastructure, you know, uh, public health safety, uh, there, there are certain key words that are in each and every one of these documents pertaining to the implementation and rolling out, which is already the law, it's already in the Federal Register as the law, and I have that here, and I'll just give you the date so you guys can look it up. It's in the Federal Register from Tuesday, September 24, 2013, 21 CFR Part 16, 801-803, Unique Device Identification System Final Rule. So it all comes back to the technology. It all comes back to the consolidation of power. It all comes back to the directives that are signed uh, extra judicially or beyond the Constitution or beyond the uh, congressional oversight or outside of it or, or around it. And we are being fast-tracked right into this 
new world order while our eyes are, are being kept or directed to other things. You know, why not talk all about what happened in Ottawa today? Well, because and, while we're talking about that, this is what's happening behind our backs. Yeah, it, it's interesting. You know, we noticed a, a we noticed a pattern here with our government and with the United Nations and their system of of uh, authoritarianism that you know they commit genocide on mass scales. They care less of for humans than they they care more for animals than they do for humans it seems they have no value on human life yet all this intrusion on our civil liberties is done so in the name of public safety and public health uh, improvement you know from the obamacare to the gun safety to uh you know now these uh, series of federal health initiatives to roll out a biosurveillance plan or a digital 21st century government plan to implement a architecture that will uh, have all the information needed and what they go on to say in the army document and we'll end that with this is that through this document it will give you a means of authentic authentication and identification which it fits right in with the, uh, it fits right into the digital currency. It fits right into the the voter ID laws that we haven't even uh, talked about. It fits into the digital currency. Did I say that? It doesn't really matter. It, it should be said again. This is all a big push toward this one world government one world system of finance and of course yeah. the one world religion folks we're up against the top of the hour our first hour guest was Avi Lipkin and of course his website you can visit his website um, it, it, it's linked off of Hagman and Hagman.com but his website is Vic Mord which is a combination of Victor Mordecai his alias on the internet VicMord.com his books he's got six of them there uh, I recommend each and every one, actually, and the one in particular that we discussed this evening was Islamic Threat Updates Almanac Number no. 1, and that was written back in 2003, where he talked about the Islamic plans to destroy the West during the first, well, the first year after the 9-11 attacks. It's pretty interesting, very interesting, and on point and relevant today. Folks, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. Welcome back, folks, to the third and final hour of the Hagman and Hagman Report. I want to apologize for the sound issues if you had any trouble hearing. It, maybe it was just me, the communication between Joe and I here in the studio, separated by a half glass wall, and of course it's a little bit difficult, but it sounded like Joe was underwater for a couple of times, which made the conversation for me a little bit, um, a little bit troublesome. If you had that problem, too, we apologize. Don't know what it is. But nonetheless, we're regrouped back. It went to the first hour, just to recap, Avi Lipkin, that's Avi Lipkin, very dynamic personality. And telling it like it is, Islam, according to Avi Lipkin, and I wholeheartedly agree, once, it's, once you understand it, it is a criminal psychosis greater than the Nazi party. And of course, the satanic influence, the satan not the satanic influence, but the satanic nature that is Islam. If you you've got to understand what Islam is to really understand what we're dealing with. I get an email here, and I want to thank uh, I want to thank you, Janet from um, from Oklahoma, who who said, "Hey, you, you began talking about a story yesterday." Uh, or she, she writes yesterday or the day before, and you didn't finish it, and it was about a surveillance that I conducted. And there, there's kind of a lesson behind it. And Joe and I were talking during the break about a couple of different things. Let me just kind of set the stage here, and I think, folks, you'll enjoy this, because it does have relevance to current-day events. Um, as an investigator, I, of course, I had um, – and in, been involved in, with working as an operational asset for the Department of Justice as well as for the FBI, as well as for the state police. And uh, oh, that's our studio dog. Come on in, take a bark. 
Okay, that's our actually that's our studio dog, lady, and uh, what what a what a what a great, uh, just what what a what a great choice she is. But having said that, uh, I just want. <laughs> I'm going to post a picture, by the way, folks. This is on HagmanHagman.com of of our new Australian Shepherd, relatively new, uh, about two weeks prior to King's death. Uh, um, hoping to, to maybe breathe some young new life into in the King. Uh, uh, we were able to. Well, we we adopted a, an Australian Shepherd that's going to be unceremoniously given away or left on the street. So very intelligent dog, smarter than us at times, and uh, it's just great. I actually grabbed a grabbed a, a thing of Nature Box snacks the other day and hit underneath the chair. But anyway, uh, Janet, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll explain what happened with this FBI thing. And Joe and I were talking again during the break about the government and about the different nuances, and you'll see the relevance as this as the story develops. But this is back, I think, 1991, 92, 93, in that time period. I was working, and this is prior to Joe, but Joe's going to be Joe and I are going to be building on this because it's important. Um, it was in the early 1990s, and I had been working on this theft case in conjunction with a municipal police department in the state of Ohio, along with the state police in Ohio, along with the FBI. And the reason the FBI became involved is because the dollar amount was so vast, and it was an interstate theft ring that actually involved multiple states. And we're talking tens of, well, multi-million dollar thefts. And it was it was actually when computers were just hitting, you know, the personal computers, just hitting the markets, and personal computers were being sold, and um, the trucking company had an exclusive contract for the, I want to say the, the motherboards, but also the other comp- various components for these computers. So, so the value at the time were very was very high. Well, a couple of industrious dock workers you can believe this, were involved in the theft and sale, black market sale of computer components. And again, we're talking a whole boatload of money. The company, and I'm not going to get into the names or anything like that, but the company, what they did was they, the, the security part of the company, they, they put cameras in the on the docks and everything. Well, the people who were stealing from stealing the shipments knew about the cameras and so there was a leak within the company the um, the, the head of this the president of this corporation this trucking corporation contacted me and I had agreed to take on this case this case involved me actually and, and, and folks just Kind of in the back of your mind, as a PI, you know, you think Magnum PI with a Ferrari or, you know, the girl on an arm or whatever. No, 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 it's not the case. This company was located in Central Ohio, as many of the tr- trucking companies are, and the dock that was under surveillance and the people where some of the transactions were occurring, at least some of the low-level transaction, was in the, in the back of this trucking company. So that's where we started. That's where I started. And what happened, or as luck would have it, there was this very seedy motel that was located across the parking lot or this long stretch of concrete that was abutted against the back of the hotel. Of this, You might as well think of it like the Bates Motel, except with bed bugs. Okay. Bates Motel, for those not old enough... Yeah, we never stayed in any kind of uh, two or three star hotels, any fancy places. We um, yeah. we had the cheaper ones. Exactly. Well, well, I had to get a room that had the window facing this particular part of this lot that allowed. And this was a single floor hotel. Okay, so the um, as far as my part was concerned. I had to conduct surveillance, really 24-7 surveillance, just to get an idea of the schedule. And, and uh, 
the activities and identify the people. So I was I was really stuck, confined to a room uh, that was probably no bigger than maybe your living room uh, in this very seedy motel, very unclean, very just yucky for a month, for a full month. Now, if you can envision this, and, and this does apply to our government today, and, and just think about this. Um, we had talked to the, the head of the trucking company, had talked to the municipal police chief who said, boy, this is well over my head. The municipal police chief had talked to the state police. The state police had became involved, but they also involved the FBI. And, of course, I was using all of our equipment, my equipment at the time, camera equipment, surveillance equipment at the time. Well, finally, and just to make this long and very sorted story short, uh, the FBI finally says, hey, from the other end of the spectrum, they had identified where some of these computer parts were going, with the ultimate destination, the, the end users. And they were going actually, in, in one case, overseas, and in another case, uh, um, um, throughout various states. So this is a pretty large operation. The point I'm trying to get after 30 days, and this was in the summer, it was hot, and I mean hot. No air conditioning in this motel. Uh, 24, again, 24 seven, fast food diet. You get the picture, okay? Just grimy, dirty. Um, finally, the FBI says, all right, we're gonna send an agent to oversee the surveillance operation, to take over the operation, and to basically help you, but they're going to, this agent is going to handle everything, and you are going to be uh, uh, used as an operational asset for the FBI. So the agent that was assigned to the case, fresh out of the academy, he was an accountant by profession, took the, uh, the test for the FBI, was trained, and this is his first surveillance case ever. Walks into so a hotel room. About as much experience as your average TSA or DSA uh, uh, Yes, yes. So if you can picture this. Now, I thought I was all that. You know, I thought I was, boy, was, you know, this is, you know, really great. I thought that. And by the way, I did have all the names, and I had all sorts of documentation. Back then, we used the, the bigger cassette tapes. So the storage for the surveillance, the cassette tapes would fill maybe three or four banker's boxes. If you can picture the banker's box size, that was the surveillance video. And so I had to catalog everything, did all of the grunt work. This FBI agent came in, and he was all of about 29, 28, 29 years old. And the first thing that um, he, he looked at me and he said, all right, I'm in charge now. Uh, you're going to do exactly what I tell you to do. I said, yeah, no problem, no problem at all. Thinking that he had some experience in surveillance and, and uh, interstate theft. Well, he did, but just on the books. So to cut to the final chapter, the final scene here of this movie or this tale, it was... On a Saturday morning, we had collected, I had collected along with the, uh, with actually the chief of the municipal police department, an undercover officer, we had collected all of the necessary information for a complete takedown of this operation, at least on the Ohio side. And it was great because the police chief was happy, everyone was extremely happy. All right. We planned we actually, the FBI planned for a Saturday morning meeting at 9 o'clock in the morning. There was going to be a controlled buy at 10.30 that morning. And, um, of course, they were going to use my surveillance van. And I say mine. Joe was not in the picture at this time. My surveillance van and my camera equipment. And so in the hotel room, there was me, the police chief of this town in Ohio, city in Ohio, the undercover agent or the undercover officer that was also working the case and the FBI agent who, once again, all of 28, 29 years old, fresh out of the academy, never worked a street surveillance or never worked a surveillance before, ever. 
he walks in and he starts barking orders and saying this is how it's going to go down. And and really, the well, I had no problem with it. The police chief just was rolling his eyes and couldn't just this is like oh my gosh, you know. And, and this is my first taste, I think, of the federal government coming in, you know, as as a knight in shining armor, so to speak, or thinking they're a knight in shining armor. And this is also a lesson in not not to take yourself so seriously as this as this uh, FBI agent did. So he said, "Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get all get in the surveillance van, and we're all going to, you know, go to this area in this parking lot. And Doug, you're going to operate the camera equipment. Uh, Joe, the uh, police chief, you're going to do this. The undercover officer, you're going to do this. And I mean, he's barking orders left and right. So you, you get the picture. Oh man." I, I just looked at the chief of police. I said, you know, the surveillance of van, the, the vehicle is really not a clown car, which is what this guy wanted to make it to be. But we, we went along said, okay, no problem. So we pulled up into this assigned area. We were all inside of the surveillance van. It was hot. There was no air conditioning. You couldn't turn on the motor. You're talking about um, temperatures, I'm sure, 110, 115 degrees inside this, this tin can and an FBI agent continually saying, this is what I'm in charge of, and always reminding us that he was in charge. So we arrived there within plenty of time to catch this particular deal that we had to catch, and, and uh, so we sat there, and the police chief whispered to me, he said, can't you just do something just to get this guy, you know, uh, what, let's... Basically, let's uh, haze this guy because he's getting on everyone's nerves, meaning the FBI agent. And I, I just kind of laughed and I thought, you know, well, we could do something, I'm sure, you know, push him out of the van at a, at a very particular time or something. But of course, that would result in us getting in a little bit of trouble. Rather than doing that, having worked again for a solid month, having all of the documentation ready, everything hinged on this one transaction, this one moment, this one, I mean, we had to get this particular video and audio just right. We had identified the people involved. This guy, I mean, he was working for his first arrest, first takedown, first federal case. He wanted everything perfect. So I, we had set up the cameras through the various uh, workings of the van, I mean, the, the back of the van. It looked like a construction van, basically, as one would see. And it was marked as a construction van for that particular area of the country. And the cameras were just a humming. They were ready to go. And he turned around, the FBI agent turned around, looked at me and says, you don't do a thing. And I can remember his face. And he had this Brooklyn accent, too, which really made everything worse. He looked at me and says, you don't do a thing until I say you do it. I said, okay, not a problem. And he gave every order out to the police chief. He gave every order out to me. The thing he didn't tell me to do was the thing that he needed most. The thing that he didn't tell me to do was turn on or to uh, activate the audio and video surveillance equipment. I mean, it, it, was, it was running, but to actually press the tape button, if you will. The whole thing went down, and he looked at me and he said, I hope you got that. I mean, it was just with that attitude, I hope you got that. And it was it was probably a, a 45 second to a minute piece of transaction. Working a month for really 45 seconds. 24/7 a month for 20 or for 45 seconds, and he says, "I hope you got that." And I just looked at him, and the police chief knew exactly what I was going to say. Joe, you know exactly what mm -hmm. what I did. I said, "You know what? You didn't tell me to turn yeah. anything on." In and fact, he, you told me not to do anything. That's right. And I'm going to tell you something. The, the the chief did everything. He, I mean, he was really cool about it. He knew that we got it. He knew I turned the thing on. Of course, I was going to turn it on. But this FBI agent, actually, um, I've never seen anybody turn as red 
purple multicolor as he did. Did he pull a gun on you? Um, he was about ready to, let me tell you, and he was about ready to, to put me in cuffs. It was almost as if he had to live in that hotel for 30 days with the bugs and the heat and the and the um, hookers and the sweat and all of that. But the fact is, that was our F- that was an FBI agent. Now you might think, well, wait a minute, that's just really a picky thing. But when you combine the attitude and the interfacing between the private sector and our government. Joe and I had a, a, a very, and you might think, well, that was just a waste of, you know, 15 minutes of my life. I'm not going to get back. But, but, but there's a lesson here, I think. Uh, obviously, you know, not to take ourselves so seriously. But also, Joe, um, the efficiency or lack thereof, and I think we, we put a lot of stock into our federal government, our, our FBI agents, and there are a lot of great FBI agents that, that I've worked with, but a lot of people who just come out of the shoot and are really um, – uh, you know, <laughs> incompetent to the point of being of hurting themselves. I thought yeah, that was really. Uh, but uh, you know, we had worked another immigration case as well. Joe and I did where we we uh, and I'll end on this. And and Joe, I'll let you tell this because you tell this better than, than I did. Working uh, involved uh, really a fraud case that overlapped in the immigration, and in this happened in Queens, New York. Um, in this multicultural, wonderful multicultural district in Queens. Casino Boulevard. Right. Where everything is in some foreign language. If you, if you were dropped there from an aircraft or if we blindfolded you, put you in the, into this neighborhood, you wouldn't know where you were. Perhaps Chinatown or you know, perhaps someplace in China or Korea or depending on which part of this area you, we, we'd put you there. But this happened to be, we happened to be in this Chinese section. No one spoke any English. Everything was in Chinese. Cell phones were in Chinese. The writing on cell phones. Um, we had this case where we had to identify someone. Yeah, we, have a file, we got a file with a name uh, right. of the person who we were to investigate and some information of theirs, like their date of birth and not their address, though. Uh, they had the uh, approximate they had an address, but it wasn't the correct address. And, and it was the equivalent of the the, the the Chinese name was the equivalent of Smith in Chinese. Okay, I, I don't remember the exact name, but it was just a common name. Right, and we pull up to this, you know, uh, apartment building, this project building where there's got to be, you know, 400 apartments. Everybody is living there is Chinese, uh, and and to start it out. Uh, I was kind of hungry, and, and my dad said, "Hey, there's chicken over here." They had there's a lot of um, you know people who have food carts in New York, and they had a variety of different foods from good pretzels and pizza to, to this chicken uh, on, in Chinatown. And we at least we th- we th- we thought it was chicken. And uh, the guy said, "You know, do you like it hot?" And he said, "Yeah, hot." So the guy put some pepper on there and. We walk away, and, and I take a bite into it, and my tongue started melting out of my mouth. Literally, it was so hot. Uh, I think I, I poured uh, my dad's Red Bull on my tongue and on the chicken that I was eating. Uh, so that was the start of, of going uh, into this guy's neighborhood. But we subsequently went into, after two days of looking through this building and trying to find somebody who spoke English, got an apartment number. We go up to, the, I think it was the sixth floor, and if I remember properly, there were bullet holes in the lobby win, uh, the lobby windows. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. There, there were actually sections of, of the uh, uh, first floor that had plywood for windows as opposed to the, the glass, and then the adjacent glass had the, um, the telltale signs of the, of the of bullet holes as well as the lobby walls in, in different places. So, yeah. That's the kind of area that we were in at that at that point. And we get up to this apartment and we knock on the door. And four to five gentlemen in uh, what they call whitey tidies, tidy whiteys, tidy whiteys, all Chinese, answer the door, each with a bowl of rice in their hand. None of them spoke English. Um, none of them had shirts on. And my dad managed to, to get a phone from one of their hands. And as he discovered, it was an all-Chinese. Uh, 
You're muted. Oh, sorry about that. If you can, yeah, I couldn't believe this. And if you can imagine walking into a very hot, very stinky, very small hallway, a very narrow hallway, walking up to this, I think it was, what did you say, the fourth or sixth floor? I don't know. Sixth floor. Okay. And, and finally, finding the person of interest, you knock on the door, expecting one person and expecting a normal environment or what would be somewhat normal, even if they had stick furniture uh, for furniture, and the door opens, and here is this, it almost looked like a herd of cats or how cats would herd or come to the door, come to a door that, that is open. And this is not, I'm not, we're not stereotyping anybody, but to see this, and I, look, we have no clue what they were what they were doing, why they were all in their underwear, with the exception it was hot, but it certainly wasn't, I don't know, how hot would it have to be for you to be in your underwear with five six, seven guys in the, in the apartment. I just don't understand that. And, of course, each holding, and it's, it was, you had to almost, you have to envision this, each holding a bowl of rice. And um, you know, it, the only way we can communicate yeah, We're not making any signs. of this up. <laughs> no, no. And, and, and trying to communicate with hand signs, hand signals. Finally, the one guy, the, as Joe said, the, one, one of the gentlemen surrendered his cell phone and, um, it was it was all in Chinese. The uh, I guess you, you know as we talk about these things, we. we <laughs> you, you, by the way, um, further investigation did we did find out this particular apartment and in fact this entire building for that matter was nothing more than this recycling immigration illegal immigration type of uh, operation where the owner. Um, of the of the building was deeply involved in bringing immigrants from China from Asia over into the United States and then sending them out to the, to the workforce. So these people had no clue they were being used basically as human slaves, work slaves here in the United States. They were more victims than they were perpetrators in my estimation. But the fact is, if if we could have caught a photograph, and we should have at the time, I think we were just so, so doggone stunned, Joe, that it was just amazing. But the other part of this equation, too, is when we did talk with the immigration department, like now, now we're talking 2007, uh, with the immigration officials, the, the um, ICE people, what would be ICE today, um, but when we did talk with them, they knew about this operation, and but they, they they knew about this this whole sorted operation, and allowed it to continue and had prior knowledge of it. So how you know I guess how do you explain this? Except this is during the Bush years. This is all being done, not under the radar, but very overtly. And there were, um, the, I'll say this as well, based on what we found out later, you could knock on that door on a Monday and have a half a dozen people, men from China there. You could knock on the door on a Tuesday and have another different, a whole different six or eight people at the door. And the same with Wednesday, the same with Thursday. Sadly, this was nothing more than the portal to the United States. Um, I was going to, you know, sh share the funny part of it. I, I suppose the humorous aspect is, is how they they answered the door, but I, I, I suppose this speaks to more toward the how the system is broken and um, um, how things are uh, how things are all just really twisted right now. I, I guess I, you know it's just it was one of those things that, that Joe and I were reminiscing today, and uh, you really had to. I suppose you had to be there. It, it maybe didn't come off well over over the radio but nonetheless we did have a good laugh over it just because of the appearance and our and, and I suppose our shock reaction but you know what you walk down the street and it's nothing to these people in New York City people in Iowa people in Idaho people who have never been to New York City or at least into that that component of New York City they don't have a clue as to what's really taking place in, in the larger cities I'm sure this happens in Los Angeles and other large cities, but um, once again, I, I think that this speaks to 
whether it's it's a it's a it's an FBI agent who is who is taking himself and his position much more serious than than need be, or whether it's the broken system of immigration. I I, I suppose you know, we've <laughs> it, it is kind of sadly it, it's something that um, that we've experienced and um, wanted to share at least during the break. We thought it would be a good idea. Not and so sure how that came across, but I'm still getting reports that some people are saying I still sound like I'm underwater. So I don't know what's going on. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go to the phone. We're going to go to let's see, area code. Uh, I know that Jack from Washington wanted to come on. He was on hold. He dropped off. Jack, if you're still listening and you still want to come on, I know you had some Ebola news you wanted to share. Give us a call back, and we will uh, take your call right away. But if uh, not, that's fine. We're going to go to area code 210 right now. 210, you're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. 210? Hi, can you hear me? There yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I can make sure you can hear me fine. Is everything all right? The communication? Yeah, yeah you're fine. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, yeah, the, uh, I want to underscore, I, I, I do a lot of study of Katy Perry's uh, videos. I want to underscore what Nathan says about them uh, taking our children. That is their number one goal. That is the head uh, in Revelation that is uh, that is wounded, that is healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. I want to, I want to underscore that. I have really seen that in Kitty Perry's videos. And um, the other thing is uh, these uh, when when the first um, when this thing when the tribulation does break out, I think it breaks out with World War Three, and we will see one third of the trees burn up and all the green grass with that, uh, which is the first trumpet. But after that, I think we're going to win, and then there will be a period of peace and safety. So I think it's important that Christians not freak out when they uh, see that one third of the trees burn up and all the green grass. And I, well, and I'm then, then down over that. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't mean to, I, I don't mean to sound. Uh, I mean, how could you seeing one third of the trees and animal life die? Right. Like Stan had talked right. about. I mean, you'd have to. Um, yeah, that would cause certainly cause everyone to take notice, wouldn't it? I mean, and and right. does that? Okay, all right. Yeah, but see, right. the, somehow, and we don't know how, they're going to demonize us because we're Christians. And of course, when we see the trees, we're going to be telling everybody, "Hey, this is a tribulation. This is a tribulation." And somehow, we got to not let them demonize us. So I, you know, you know, we have to tell people, "Hey, this is your last chance. We're all." The, the population of the earth is getting ready to re, be reduced drastically. Most of us, this is our last chance to be safe. And a lot, of, and, and it's a really good chance for them to demonize us. So well, Isn't that, isn't of, that what's happening now? I, I mean, yeah. to, to a large right, extent. Right. I think Avi had uh, uh, created that, uh, or at least uh, indicated that the, my goodness, the Look, look, look at what look at what's taking place over in the Middle East, or Syria, for example, and, and uh, Iraq, where they're crucifying Christians. You don't hear about this, or in Pakistan, where uh, Christians are being beaten to death by by uh, religious icons. Uh, they're being uh, the women are being kidnapped and raped and sold into sexual bondage and slavery. Uh, it, it, it's it's an all out war against Christians. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the this children them taking our children we you know um, many many dreams on Steve's website have said you know pray for your children many and Steve says it over and over again a lot of other uh, pastors say it but Nathan says it a whole bunch of people say it um, <laughs> you better pray that we're not separated from our children because that that's the, that's the the head the deadly the we're the sixth head of the beast they're going to chop that head off. And they're going to re-resurrect it, not in this land, in another land, but they're going to be American people speaking with an American dialect, but it's our children. And it all goes back to, and I, I see this in Katy Perry's videos. I see it in all the things that Nathan and all you guys look at, but I see it also all over Katy Perry's videos. When you see the, uh, the Grammy Awards and she's falling backwards, 
Remember in the yeah. Uh, yes. You remember yep. that that part? You know, the then we watched Melissa, performance Melissa, of the Dark Horse. Yes. Right. And then you look at the Maleficent um, uh, Maleficent, Maleficent movie. Okay, the the Dark Horse video and the Maleficent movie follow Sun Tzu's destruction cycle. Both of them do. First, it, well, I'll start with Maleficent. Okay, you you saw the, uh, you, you may have seen the trailers if you didn't see the movie of the uh, the roots, the earth. Well, in Sun Tzu's yes. system, um, earth is broken up by wood. And then the next thing that happens in the movie is that um, Maleficent love interest chops off her wings with a handsaw. Okay, and in Sun Tzu's system, white uh, white metal chops wood. Okay, the next thing we're looking at is the red fire. Okay, and the red mm. fire is thrown onto an army and they're defeated. But first the army throws the red fire, but it's thrown back on them. And then there we have Sun Tzu's system. Red fire melts um, uh Red fire melts metal. So there we have, it starts with green. And a lot of people think that the pale horse is green. It's not. It's more of a yellow or a tan. Um, but the, the the four horses of the apocalypse are, in fact, Sun Tzu's system. White metal is melted by red fire, which is the second horse, which is put out by black water, which is absorbed by pale earth. And it's... <laughs> I, I, I've been trying to put this all Very in the Very interesting. I, 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 just, okay. So, so what you're saying is the uh, the Sun Tzu, you're comparing this to Sun Tzu, the art of war in the end times. Right. Is that what you're saying? Right. And, and, uh, okay. Yeah. And, and not to, not to over-talk you, but, but you're also saying that Katy Perry through her performances, and if I if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, yeah. emphasizing that 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 uh, she's actually telegraphing or telling us what to expect. Well, there's, there's five. There, there's four elements, and then there's all and all these different Kabbalistic systems, and there's like thirty or forty of them. Sun Tzu is just okay. one of them. And his system, Earth is the center. In in uh, Americanized witchcraft, I think uh, ether is the center element. But it doesn't matter. Um, they're using a mostly Sun Tzu system in both the movie, and I can go through the whole movie and I can show you every single <laughs> every single um, element. I can go through the the video, and they got five women in the video, the music video. They got five women and five men, and Katie is the eleventh, and she she first, and she alternates with some of the characters. And the last three three different characters are three different elements. Uh, Right. The last one that she, the last one that she alternates with is the dark horse. The first one that she alternates with is the center pale earth, which okay, would, and, which and, would correspond with the pale horse, right? Yeah. So she, that's what she's doing right there, um, and 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 she's showing that the system starts out with pale earth. It goes through the five elements and it ends up. That's the pale earth is the old world order. Pale earth is the new world order. So, you. you you go through the whole system from pale earth to pale earth. So she starts out with the old world order is pale earth, and she, then she shows the green horse, but there is no green horse in the Revelation. That's because it's not a world of war. That's the only reason the Revelation doesn't show the green horse, because it's not a world of war. It's, I, I believe it's a, uh, a local conflict with Israel. If this thing breaks out, it'll break out according to uh, these Kabbalistic systems. They associate these elements with seasons. And uh, and they're not using some two seasons; they're using a different season. And the, um, the this thing would break out in a, you know in between seasons. It could be any and and the, the next in between season that we have coming up is November sixth, number November seventh. And um, uh, you know, I, so. I, I, I see where you're, I, I I can follow the logic that you're applying here, both with the Sun Tzu Art of War as well as the Book of Revelation, the, the, the different pale horses, and also the witchcraft, the elements of witchcraft, including ether and the earth and such. So I, I, I can follow that. What I'd like you to do is, if you've got this down, and I know that it's it's hard to compress in the time we have, if you've got this down, or if you can, write, write this out. I'd like to take a look at, at this 
uh, what you're uh, what you're postulating here. This would be good. Yeah, I I have a problem. I I, I can't ma- I can't make a, a video of it because it's all you know copyrighted stuff. YouTube will just uh, take the audio out, and so I'm trying to make a web page of it, and 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 uh, and I don't know how long it'll stay up, but it's well, all copyrighted. Well, but. What, with respect to the children, Katy Perry, Nathan Leal, we you know talked about this. I mean, we could take screen captures. The bottom line here: the children, of course, are the ultimate surprise or sacrifice, uh, surprise sacrifice, if you will. I mean, it, it does come down to the children and the capturing of our children in the upcoming days. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, that's, it, that's the whole thing. They're, they're, and, and that's what they say when the, the whole movie Maleficent is. At the age of 16, she will prick her finger. That's why in 2000, um, in 2000, they stopped uh, putting uh, mercury in the vaccines because they're taking care of these children. That's why they're having a drought in California because in California, that's where they have a lot of uh, um, uh, radioactive produce, and if they if they just dry it all up. Less of that radioactivity will get out to the children that they want to make a nation of in a different land three or four years okay. from now. Wow. The, the, there, okay, there you lost me, but I I, under, I I followed you up to that point. There you lost me. But I, I do understand with uh, the drought. Of course, the drought is, if you look at that, do the research, it's man-made. So we're going to cut you loose. I'd love to have you send me an email with respect to what you just said, if you if you have it down, at least in a, in a kind yeah, of an what, outline what, format. What, what kind of... What kind of what, what should I put in the title that you'll see it? That you'll you'll remember um, what it is. Just just Katy Perry. Uh, that that would be good. Send it to me, um, and you can use the interface at Hagman at Hagman dot com. And you're not going to get a response back. The email was was received. Yeah. I'm working and trying to work right. on that, but nonetheless, I'll get it. And I'll send you an acknowledgement. I'd like to take a look at that uh, again. You, you kind of lost this, yeah. lost me anyway at the at the uh, at the drought, but. I, I follow you up to that point. I think you're onto something. We're going to move on to another call. God bless you, my friend. Thank you so much for that. Okay. But, uh, right. Interesting, interesting, Joe. Interesting the way. Uh, once again, going back to Katy Perry, and our, our listeners are very astute in the in the occult nature of the inter- Hollywood and entertainment industry. So it's uh, and it, it is all about the children. Yeah, it, it is, and and the messages that they, uh, you know, I've never heard the theory of uh, that. Art of War and, and the uh, the horses of, from Revelations is something I'm going to check out. And, uh, definitely, you send that forward that to me, Dad, when you get that email. But let's go to another caller here. We're going to go to area code eight zero five eight zero five. You're up next. You're live on the Hagman and Hagman Report. Eight zero five. They dropped off. They dropped off. All yeah, right. I've, I've noticed that. Uh, I've noticed that, that dropping off here a lot more lately since PKR changed the format. Go ahead. We're going to go to 509 next. 509, you are live on the Hagman and Hagman Report on this Wednesday night. Go ahead. Hello? Yeah, you're up, sir. Oh, hello. Hi, Doug and Joe. Good to hear from hey. you guys. Well, I just I'm wanted to call in called. just to say, yeah, I'm glad I... Uh, call too. I just want to say, hey, I love you guys and I really thank you for all the guests you bring on and as a man that does not go to church and has a a family, I really appreciate everything you guys do and all the guests you bring on because you guys are my my family and uh, that's about it. Wow, well that's awful nice. We appreciate you being part of our listening family and uh, uh, love to love to, you know, hear, you're on the Pacific Northwest, are you not? Yeah, I'm in Spokane, Washington. Okay, all right. Yeah, and uh, um, oh. so it's uh, it's pretty interesting here. Like last week, a little heads up. Last week uh, on Tuesday night and Thursday night of last week, I had C-130s doing drills over my house with no lights on it, about a thousand feet, and several of my coworkers heard the same planes but never went outside to look at them. And I have a friend that works at the local hospital, and they had some somewhat Ebola crisis is going on, but nothing that came to fruition. So, you know, it's like everybody here is kind of paranoid, kind of freaked out, doesn't know what to do, and 
It's, it's very interesting you say that. I, I, I did get a couple of um, emails from people around the Spokane area. Have you seen any ground uh, movement of ground uh, ground movement of military style armaments or military uh, equipment? Anything on trains or over the highways or anything? No, I have not. And uh, but I work I work in kind of the hospital district, and I I work actually in a clinic, and I have a lot of patients and. No one has really seen anything. They've all just kind of heard stuff, you know, like airplanes, you know, and when I kind of mentioned to them, you know, the different things that I've heard that they kind of kind of reinforced that, you know, I'm not going crazy. Well, from, but Well, from the so, Pacific Northwest, let, let me ask this. From the Pacific Northwest, uh, what is your take on things that are taking place? I mean, uh, we could we could talk about the about uh, Ferguson, for example. There, That's about to erupt again after... The findings, you know, um, that uh, that perhaps the witnesses that are now coming forward might uh, might vindicate this police officer. But uh, all all in all, what are you hearing over in Spokane that has you worried? Aside from the military movements or the things you can't see in the air. Well, I am uh, I'm about 20 minutes away, maybe a half hour away from Idaho, from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and. Uh, and you know, I was hoping that Idaho would be one of those states that would not acquiesce to the same-sex marriage, and now I see it coming to my town. So I'm probably going to be one of those that's going to go over there to protest this because, you know, this is just really kind of irritates me, and it's just wrong. And uh, but from what I've seen, you know, um, we're like a white-collar town. We're a pretty. This is a pretty poor area. A lot of farming. Um, just a lot of, you know, pretty much our whole industry consists of banking and the medical. And then everything else is kind of, you know, on the decline. And, you know, my wife was laid off like several years ago. She's kind of working from home. And it's it's just like really interesting, uh, just the, the level of oppression that's in this town. So it's pretty volatile. And, you know, fortunately, I'm hoping that I can escape if, you know, need be or if I have to, you know, whatever the good Lord wants me to do. But, you know, it's just uh, it's just one of those places. It's We're kind of, I think, low on the list when it comes to, you know, big cities because, you know, we are a city of about 600,000 people, but it's really spread out. There's a lot of rural areas, a lot of farming. But we do are, you know, we do have dams and we are a pretty um, – sufficient, self-sufficient area here. So it's interesting because we have a big Russian population. I've noticed a lot of Middle Easterners, um, you know, where I haven't seen them in the past. I've lived here eight years, and, you know, I see I, in my area there's really no reason for, 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 for people, you know, to just show up here because there's no, really no industry, no jobs. And I've seen a lot of Middle Easterners, and I've seen, you know, especially in the grocery store, I, it's just really interesting, you know. Just there's a lot of things that are, are out of the ordinary that I've observed over the past, especially six months and over the past year. So I, I don't know. know but the demographics are changing in Spokane, certainly. Yes, they are. Wow. Okay. And, well, I'm, and you know, and I, I have some, you know, interesting enough, you know, God bless the women out there because I try to, you know, feel out my patience and you know the women are the ones that are the most awake and and you know it's it's just really interesting because you know i just wish there were more men awake <laughs> because uh, yeah, you, know. yeah. I, you had me worried there for a second when, uh, but no i i, I get I, I get what you're saying the the uh, female population and, and we find that here as well the, the the women of the families appear to be paying more attention than the guys are so yeah uh, I get that. Yeah. yeah, so it's uh, it's just interesting, and, um, you know, it's just one of those things. That I listen to you guys a lot. I have the night off. I'm making enchiladas. Cool. While my wife's off doing other stuff, I'm like, I thought I'd call in, and here I am talking to you guys. Fantastic. So I just, uh, yeah, just want to say, that. hey, I appreciate it. And, you know, one other thing, you know, this whole uh, gay marriage thing and how the, what is it, the mayor of Dallas or the governor of Dallas, I think it's the mayor of Dallas, how she's He's totally done. pushing this thing. Well, you know, in the Bible, how it talks about drunkards, and uh, you know, so what is that going to be next? If if I'm a drunkard and I like don't like a preacher talking about you know being a drunkard, are they going to come and shut down my church too? Or well, because uh, you know, yeah, yeah. I speak out about being a drunkard. 
uh, yeah, think- how, far, how far can they take that? I, look, I, I think that the, the homosexual activism that's involved with the preachers or with ministers and pastors, uh, I really do believe that that's the battleground. That's going to be the battle line. And boy, if you get a chance to, to make your voice heard in Coeur d'Alene, uh, with respect to the, the the pastors being kind of held hostage, and I know that there's stories about that. Um, some say that that's overblown, but I don't think it is. I think that's around zero for uh, criminalizing Christianity. And of course, yeah, yeah, I think you're right on the money. So, but you yeah, make you a know, good point. But yeah, well, as far as Coeur d'Alene goes, it's one of those places where I, I uh, you know, I I know some people that live over there and. The, the general feeling of the area is uh, most people, even in Spokane, where um, there's, a, there's a, a large Christian population, and it's just really interesting, like, where these people come from that start pushing these agendas, and it's, it is, it's just really interesting, I mean, it, because, I mean, I've, I've, I've moved over here from Seattle, and I've never met so many Christians before, but as as we all know, there's like limpers to Christians and like true Christians, but there's still this this air of being proud to say you're a Christian. So it's just really interesting where these where these people come from that like start, you know, uh, fueling this fire of uh, you know trying to go against Christianity, especially in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I mean, yeah, that's not North Idaho, to... and right. They, they, look, they're, they're, they follow the money, and and I think we'll have our answers. You're looking at the larger agendas here. Uh, it goes it it goes far beyond the homosexual activism. That's just the tactic that's being used to silence and to wage war against Christian Christianity, and ultimately to uh, you know to to uh, well to wage war against us and for the ultimate uh, criminalizing of Christian Christians and categorizing any Christian sermons as hate speech. Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, I want to say God bless you both, and um, thank you again for all that you do, and uh, I really appreciate you, and you have really guys have both really made a difference in my life. So. Well, thanks, brother. Yeah. Appreciate it. No, God all bless you guys. Time. God bless. All right, man. Thank Bye-bye. you so much. You have a good night. Fantastic call. Yeah, yeah. And, and folks, in the event that you, you, you think you feel like tonight's program's off a little bit, it is. We're having so many technical difficulties. You just cannot believe uh, the technical sound issues we're having. And co- some cognitive difficulties, too. Uh, you know what? We were jumped into the, uh, the medical device stuff at the top of the second hour, and what I told my dad, I just remembered now, was with the get it, we were going to get into the new Council on Foreign Relations North American trade document. That's what we were supposed to get into. And uh, well, the, yeah, the, this the, is equally important, though. I mean, no, I know, but I didn't have it ready to uh, to to give out the information in a, in any kind of comprehensive manner uh, in a way I'd like to. So that was the the one issue, but that's okay. Um, we can yeah, always take a work tomorrow. All right. No, I think it worked out all right. I mean, it's an important document. I think it's important to, to understand what's going on behind the scenes, you know, while everyone is so focused on, uh, on on the things that are taking place, especially today in Ottawa, which I don't want to diminish what's going on, but I think that we have to understand, too, that while our eyes are, are transfixed on the shooting in Ottawa, this is, you know, Steve Quill says, you know, put it in perspective, in terms of the world events, and I think that while and, and this is the signature of the Illuminati, uh, the Illuminati captured media is to keep us focused while the mischief takes place behind the scenes elsewhere. So, folks, we're at the end of the program. I want to thank you so much for listening tonight. Thank you for putting up with us and uh, hanging in there with us for just a fantastic first hour with Avi Lipkin. Next Monday we have him coming back, folks. If you if you um, haven't already done so, please sign up for the Prophecy Forum's November Columbus Conference. We'll be there. Russ Dizdar, of course, Greg Evenson. Uh, it's going to be a fantastic conference. That's November 14th. Bill Salas. 15th. Bill Salas, Doug Krieger. Um, my goodness. Uh, Doug Woodward is going to be there. Rick Wiles of True News will also be there by teleconference, by video. So it's going to be a fantastic uh, conference. We'll be there if, uh, apparently fielding questions or at least uh, what moderating a question and answer period. I think the 
schedule is evolving, is continues to evolve. So it's not written in stone yet in terms of what we'll be doing, but that's, that does appear to be one of our tasks anyway. And we'll be we'll hopefully be broadcasting live from there. So that'll be fun. All right, we're up against the end of the show. Thank you all for tuning in. God bless you. Have a great night. We will see you back here tomorrow evening at 8 p.m.